What's up, everybody? Oh. We're uh, starting a little bit late, but that's cool. It's just like very casual here. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to the interview, episode three with the great Peter Bernstein. And um, you can pull that as, as close yes, as indeed. you want to yes, get it. Indeed. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for being here. We just thanks played a me. super fun set of music. Yeah, great to hear and, you, man. Uh, so much oh, fun. Man, great to hear you. And I heard you the other night with, with Steve Cardenas. Uh, and fun, yeah. Right here in this neighborhood, actually. So that's it's two right. weeks in a row, bro. Got yeah, you man, out to the Brooklyn best Brooklyn twice in one week. That's that's great. You know, <laughs> yeah. I don't just leave you know leave the island of Manhattan for anything or anybody. Yeah, yeah, it takes a lot. To get <laughs> exactly. Me There's a story about the great drummer Jimmy Lovelace who was going to a gig with someone. Maybe it was Ari Rowland. This is like you know, I don't know, in the '90s, and then on the, they were on the train or something going to the gig or somewhere in. Lovelace leaned over to Ari and said, you know, I haven't left Manhattan since 1979. Oh, <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> that was Lovelace, uh, you know, he was very wow. local, yeah. localized. But yeah. um, I love well, Brooklyn. Brooklyn is where, is it, where it's at. It is. It's like the new, well, now it's, it's definitely where it's at. <laughs> yeah. It became, it became that. It used to be just where people lived. That's true. And now it's That's just, uh, it used more... to be where people lived at. <laughs> yeah. Now it's like, yeah. Kind of there's more places where, out here. Yeah, Lunatico still, I, is great. Ornithology is great. There's a I haven't of, been to Ornithology oh, it's yet. It's great. Yeah. Mitch, Mitch and Rie's place. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. Great. I need to check there. it out. Yeah. And but, your place. And now, yeah. Moe's. Moe's. <laughs> <laughs> so, man, this is your second time here. I mean, you're one of my favorite guitar players, man. Oh, period. Man. Like any, any period of, of time in music. And um, you and you know, it's. it's it's kind of like this, you have a timeless way of, of, of playing where it, it, it really could be, it, you can fit in any, any style, any time. It's kind of like, I feel yeah. like you're, you're never out of place. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, at least I, from what I hear, man, like I've heard you play with Brian Blade. I've heard you play with Josh. I've heard you play with Larry Golings. I've heard you play with Lee Konitz. I mean, it's like any generation band leader Sonny Rollins, like... Yeah. Well, I try to be equally out of place in all <laughs> contexts, <laughs> just equally some, you know, level of awkward and just trying to work on being less awkward. But yeah, that's... I mean, there's many gigs that I would never even find myself on, but within the gigs that I do find myself on, I do feel there's quite a range of personalities, mm -hmm. which I love. It's just like the yeah. more I play... I mean, the more you play, you realize it's, it's a social thing. Yeah. And it's just like, because it's a social thing, it's just about hanging out with people from different walks of life and different, you know, and that, yeah. that's the fun of it. And, you know, becoming, a, you know, having that conversation with that person or those people, yet not feeling like a chameleon where you just disappear into the wallpaper, but can, you know, be yourself too. Like that's the yeah. challenge is to be part of the, the us, the we. And then also strengthen the, the I, the, yeah. the me. You know, so <laughs> that's what jazz music really gives you a chance. Like you have to try to meet the challenge of getting deeper into both, right. <laughs> you know, areas of of. I guess it's dealing with ego. Really, it's that's kind of what it is. The you know the fuel behind any desire to express yourself is some kind of ego. But right, jazz is collaborative. You know, unless you find yourself playing by yourself. And if you do, hopefully it's only like for eight bars or 16 <laughs> bars. But if it has to be for a whole gig, then it's another trip into your own just <clears throat> your monologue or something. Right. But, but otherwise, it's about that conversation. And that, that's, I just feel lucky to play with different, even on the same instrument. You know, like even yeah. Steve Cardenas couldn't be more different oh, in terms man. of your conception yeah. oh, of the yeah. instrument and play with so many guys. And that's what the guitar is. It's like it's just a blank slate really you yeah know, for whatever you but want. that guitar is like your second instrument you i played piano first that was my first you know entry into trying to make sounds was, was on a piano but uh, then i got into the guitar about 11 or 12 and i kept playing the piano kept up with things as i got into jazz i kept with the piano to try to make some sense of harmony i was learning but i didn't really i kind of let the <laughs> piano the guitar became Right. Became the thing. You know? Yeah. Um, but, but it was, what did, did you play rock first? I can't remember I did. what I played you ever both. Told me. First, I learned some folk chords and just, uh, I had a teacher, uh, 
who sold me her guitar, and she was actually a, like the art teacher in my school, or the assistant art teacher. She would bring her guitar to class, right. and uh, she would play. Oh, that looks really like a lot of fun. I want to play guitar. And she's, oh, I have an extra guitar. I'll sell it to you and give you some lessons. And so I learned some chords, and right. then I saw some kids <clears> at school <throat> playing like you know Hendrix and Cream and stuff like that. So I got into just trying to learn how to play rock. Jimi Hendrix was my first like guitar god and then from him i got into well he's talking about the blues guys right bb like king and albert king and so i checked out that and just from hearing about different guitar players got into the world of of jazz and then what was the, what was your first guitar do you my first guitar was an acoustic just a no name acoustic guitar and then when i you know showed sufficient interest to for the investment of an electric guitar which i was mm -hmm. just like it was a it was a strat it was oh, like sure. I got a, I had a blonde like a Where are the picks, man? Yeah. Come on, bro. No, do they have cameras <laughs> back then? I don't know if they even they, <laughs> No, uh there's I can visualize it perfectly, but you know, it was like this big thing and I tried to learn how to play some yeah. some blues and some and then I and then I got into jazz and uh, I think I was about 15 or 16 when I got a I traded the Strat in for a 175. It was a so store right on, one, on 48th from the Street. Strat to the 175. Yeah, because there was this blonde 175 hanging in. The was store. that the 175 on all those early records? Yeah, that's what I had. Oh, I got it when I was 15 and played it until, well, about you know 13 years. Not as long as I've had this guitar, but it was long. You know, when you're a teenager going into your just kind of starting to play out with people. But that was uh, the axe that I had, the 175 from the early 70s. It wasn't a great instrument. It was, you know, it had a certain mm -hmm. sweetness to it, but Definitely had a lot of, uh, you know, yeah. I, I eventually realized I needed a long scale guitar. I was something that had a little more, more sound, acoustic sound. But yeah, I haven't had too many guitars in my life. Very uh, monogamous with guitars. I've I've noticed. Over the years. Yeah, it's <laughs> weird. I got this Siler in 1998. I've yeah. never looked back. But yeah, I'm, we're we're weird. gonna get to get to that because I kind of yeah, just by coincidence was there. When you got that guitar, oh, and you were thinking well, we about, were, we, oh, I was really? I was taking the lesson with you, but um, you were a, you were a student back. You had just come from. I from had just Texas, come to New yeah. York, so that was '98, and oh. I I went to your house, and you were, you had your L5, which you were playing at this at right, that time, right. and you had this Zeidler guitar, and, and, I still and wasn't you sure. you weren't I still sure, wasn't and sure. you had me play both, and oh, listen, and you yeah. sat back and you listened to them, and you were like thinking, and you were like, and I, and you were like, what do you think? And I was just like, man, I've never played any guitar this nice before so right. i mean uh, the both of them so and I, I i love that l5 you had that was cool so. but that was a bit of a beast it was a you know there was some problems <clears> with it that's how i got it it was kind of like a factory second the neck angle was really kind of wrong so right i they had i had to get someone to build a wooden bridge for it so that it was like it looked like a cello like mm -hmm. the action was like this hard, you know and uh it was just a, kind of a hard guitar to play it was really yeah. tight you know it was really kind of fought back <laughs> so when I got the Zyla, I'm like, wow, this is, this is different. This is like another right. level of, of uh, I mean, it was a, yeah, it was another, it was a carved top, arch top, handmade by a, you know, and the L5 was a good guitar, but put together in a factory mm -hmm. in a little bit of a wonky way. So I was trying to Frankenstein that guitar a little bit and, uh, but I was getting used to it, which is why I was kind of torn about the Zyla. I was like, I yeah, don't know, yeah. it's like, you know, I'm just getting used to <clears throat> How to fight this guitar, but then I realized like, but so it so, was a superior instrument. And, oh uh, man! So, yeah. but when you had the one seventy five, so you got that fifteen years old. You said I was about fifteen or sixteen, just getting. And then you start college, like around eighteen years old. Yeah. Where you went to Rutgers. I right? went to Rutgers out of high school just to try with, to be around some musicians. With, with yeah. Douglas Weiss. No, Weiss what, was, was William Patterson. That's oh, where shit. I met him. Rutgers is where I met. I thought uh, he went. Okay, I'm getting confused then. Yeah, Rutgers. Uh, that was my first year out of but high school. But you guys school. were playing gigs during that time. The next time, year, right? the next okay. year. That's when I met because I, I went. <clears throat> Rutgers was great. There were some great teachers there. I mean, I got to meet uh, Ted Dunbar, who was really my, you know, still a voice in my head, and was very shaped my whole approach to going about learning. I was too. I wasn't really even ready for Ted, you know, because people yeah. went for Ted. They went to Rutgers for four years, and they went through the whole Ted thing, and I, I wasn't even ready for it, but. He laid out enough stuff for me to get to it when I could get to it, and uh, right. 
But I left Rutgers because there was more people. I went to visit a friend who was going to school, William Patterson, and they were having sessions all night. And I got mm -hmm. to hear, like, that's where I heard Bill Stewart. And there were so many great players. And Rutgers was great, but there was a heart. We, we didn't have a place to play at night. And, like, in, like the school shut down. And we, we were just trying to find a place to play. And it seemed like as great a program as it was with Ted Dunbar and Kenny Barron and all these great teachers. Larry Ridley was there. Sahib Shahab was running the big band. It was great. And great people came through. I remember Benny Carter came uh, with his big band charts and the big band played his music. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it was incredible. But at Patterson, I felt like when I went to visit, like, man, guys are playing here and it just seems like guys are really hungry. And so I just, I just transferred. It was kind of weird. I just like, I'm going to go to this school and check this. I kind of realized that jazz school as school wasn't really, a th I mean, it was a thing, but it wasn't like, about your academic record and stuff. So I was like, I want to go where I'm excited to be. So I went to Patterson. That's where I met Doug Weiss, Farnsworth, Jesse Davis, okay, so Bill you, Stewart. It was so Patterson it was a good was move. happening. So yeah. you went from Rutgers to William Patterson to New yeah. School. The New School was a couple years later. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that by that time, my first year at Patterson was when the New School started. Okay. And so I would go to the New School on Fridays and hang out there. Yeah, yeah. That was just, New School was like 12 people. At the 12 students, and yeah, it was the first so year. It was Larry Goldings was one of them, and then a few <laughs> other people. Spike was yeah. there. Mike, he wasn't yep. Spike then. He was Spike, Mike Wilner. He was Smalls, Mike yeah. Wilner. Yeah, <laughs> Mike and, Wilner. And, and Jesse Davis, I think, came. Maybe he came the second year. But I was just hanging out, and I would go and hang out and uh, on Fridays because I didn't have classes at William Patterson. So, And I was just like trying to get back to the city for, right. to go see gigs on the weekends and stuff. and Not playing gigs, just wanted to go see stuff and play sessions with people. But yeah. the new school was starting to happen, so that that was the feeling of like, this is New York. This is yeah. you know, Arnie Lawrence was like, whoever he would run into at the clubs, he would get them to, I want you to come to my school and talk right. to the kids. And so Milt Jackson came, you know, everybody came. Oh. Billy Higgins, well, Art Arnie, Blakey came. Wants Arnie, to talk to the, you know, I mean, you were you caught Arnie at the school. <clears throat> yeah, he yeah, was there like was the at thing. least my freshman year. But I think he left my sophomore year. Yeah, it was um, a different place after he was not there. But oh yeah, for sure, it started in his image which was the a non-academic jazz school yeah. just like put the students in proximity to the people that created the music or yeah but everybody was at, was at the new school jackie byard uh you know everybody was there <laughs> donald bird jim hall that's Jesus. jimmy cobb that's yeah. how i met you know a lot of people that were a big part of of my you know musical life yeah I'm so, impressed. Um, you got notes and everything. This is dude, you know, come on, man. I'm trying to make this as, as, as yeah. professional as possible. It's like the hot ones without the wings. <laughs> well, we got wine. We have so wine. You, you don't need wings Better. if you got wine. Yeah, that's you true. Know, or you could do both. We can I can yeah. get some wings in here. Well, we had Japanese that's, food. That's so. good. I'm full, man. I'm Would happy. Would you rather have I'm like happy. some you know no, some wine some good. gyoza or some hot wings? <laughs> that's <better. laughs> um yeah, so you studied with, with Dunbar, man. I, I never I never even he met Ted. Man. I never heard him live. Well, he passed right. in 98. So that will make he, complete yeah, sense then. He, yeah, he was way too young. But when I met him in 80, wow, 85, yeah, he he yeah he was only in his early 50s, but I, he had already had a stroke. Wow. And, and that's, he yeah. Was yeah, he, he didn't well, live I mean, long, but he lived an incredible life, and he was an incredible guy. He he was like a pharmacist. He studied pharmacy, and that's how he moved out to Indianapolis, apparently, from Texas. He's from Port Arthur, and he moved out to Indianapolis, apparently, to go to pharmacology school and met Wes and Mel Ryan, and, uh, and then Wes got him to sub on his gig with Melvin Ryan and Paul Parker mm -hmm. at the Missile Room in, in Indianapolis, and Ted was, you know, Wes had some other gigs to do or some other stuff, and... Ted would sub for Wes. So we got to hang with Wes and, and was tight wow. with him. He had one of Wes's guitars. <clears throat> he had one of Wes's L5s. And he had a lot of stories about Wes. And, and then he moved to New York in the, I think in the er, maybe late 60s. Late 60s, he was in New York. Mm -hmm. And played with a lot of different people. Gil Evans, he played in Tony Williams' Lifetime. He replaced McLaughlin and Tony, very kind of That's a different crazy. kind of guitar player for, for that group. But I they love mean, those records, man. Yeah, I love he's on Williams. Ego. That's that's the only reason I'm playing. I'm sitting in front of you right now, to be honest. Wow. Like Tony Williams' Lifetime, Alan mm. Holdsworth, and the, also the one with McLaughlin. Right. Wow. That's that's what how that, I got into. So jazz. you were getting the guitar, and then that got you out of. That got me. Yeah. Well, Alan Holdsworth got me out of the rock world. 
Right. Because his sound was like so mm -hmm. rock. I mean, it was right. an overdriven sound and like so legato and so like virtu virtuosic. Or but virtuosic. the language was something else, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, but then it was just like, what the fuck is he playing? <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, I so I, I kind of segued from, you know, and there was a lot of other things like Larry Carlton that kind of took sure. me from like the rock thing. And, right. I mean, Van Halen, Larry Carlton, Holsworth. Wow. And then ultimately landed in like, right. yeah, McLaughlin and yeah. Uh, then Wes. That's interesting, like, yeah. That was, that was the order. It was like Wes and then Matheny and then like kind of stuff like right. that. Right. Well, I, I remember hearing about Matheny early on when I got, got into jazz because I was just reading Guitar Player magazine and mm -hmm. who was, you know, so I was hearing about everybody from who's Django Reinhardt, who's, who's these guys, you know. And uh, but I remember seeing an article, a big interview with Pat Matheny where he was talking about Kenny Burrell and Jim Hall, and so I was like, oh, I'm going to check out these people, and I'm going to check out Pat Metheny, and, you know, that's kind of put me in some, I remember the way he talked about that kind of, you know, a certain reverence for what came before made me kind of realize, okay, this, this jazz thing is there's like a, something to go back and study, you know. Yeah. But it's funny because I think uh, <clears throat> maybe the generation that I am was like, I'm the early days of, like, MTV. That's when I was supposed to be getting into rock and roll. Was I mean, or in, already into it through the guitar, Jimi Hendrix, and all that stuff. And and then in the early '80s, rock and roll kind of became MTV, and mm -hmm. it was the synth sound, and it kind of got away from. So when I was checking out rock and roll, it was already going back, not that far, but going back to like you know when the stuff was like. Jimi Hendrix experience, like just yeah. three guys playing, and then it was becoming a whole different thing. And I liked a lot of pop music that I heard. I mean, I loved, you know, Off the Wall and Thriller. I mean, that was great. It was great music to be heard in the early '80s and stuff. But guitar-wise, the sound of it, and uh, it just took me back to like, well, rock and roll doesn't seem to be like what it was for those guys, which was the music of rebellion. It seemed mm -hmm. like to me, like jazz was more rebellious. Like I was gonna go back and check out. Jimi Hendrix, why not go back and check out the stuff before that? Go back, who's who's Charlie Parker? Who are all these kind of like, right? you know, subversive characters? Was that you before, know? so you had a Strat and then you got the 175. So yeah. uh, what was I, the segue? Like what, I mean, you get a 175 not to right. play. Not you know, to play. Well, I was already Hendrix. into jazz. That By that time right. I had heard Wes Montgomery and right. I was like, what is that? Like I can hear that he's playing blues, but there's some other stuff that I don't know what, like what notes are those? Right. What what progressions are those? That's not just like, you know, one four five blues. It's a whole nother language. And I was just like, I'd like to figure out what they're doing. You know, like <laughs> that's just, just like wow. It, I have no idea what that is. So I'd like to you know, and through Wes Montgomery, and checking out jazz guitar, got me into the world of jazz. The horn players, the piano player. Because I yeah. also loved Witten Kelly, and and I remember the first West record I got. There were two tunes with Jimmy Smith. And I was like, what's that? Organ. You know, that was yeah. like some cool. And so I got into that world. And, oh, Kenny Burrell plays with this guy, Jimmy Smith, too. And, you know, Kenny Burrell plays with John Coltrane. And John Coltrane played with Miles. And Miles, I heard about, do Jimi Hendrix and John mm -hmm. McLaughlin. And, all. So, and then Miles played with Bird. So let me check out some Bird. And then they're <laughs> talking about Bud Powell and Monk. And they're all talking about Ellington. So I would just try to put the whole pieces of jazz history together. And when I was in high school, I was, I had, you know, I got Louis Armstrong records and early Ellington, just checked everything out and was just trying to make sense of the, hist the short history of jazz. But the point I was raising about rock and roll, I think people that maybe were 10 years older than me felt that from rock and roll. Like, this is my generation's music and this is why I'm still connected to that. Yeah. Even someone like Schofield or, you know, like they, they have that, that's authentic with them. Whereas me, like, I loved rock and roll, I loved Jimi Hendrix, but then when I got a little deeper into where rock and roll was of, at my age, or, or of my, it wasn't, didn't feel like my music, you know, so I didn't, right. you know, when I heard Monk, I was like, wow, that sounds like New York City, I relate to that, you know, and <laughs> so I never really went back to uh, <clears throat> rock and roll, like, it just kind of didn't have the same pull to me, because yeah. it was like, and rock and roll is becoming, it's corporate, 
MTV was like, you know, videos and all this. And it was cool. Well, there were some at, great at, things. At that but time, and there was also like a huge glam rock kind of thing happening a, I mean, at the you know, time, you know. It was fine, which, but it just which, wasn't. Yeah. Which heavy, heavy metal was like a direct protest against all that stuff. That's like right. all those early Metallica records, they're just like, this is not glam rock. If you came here right. to see us, you know, some pretty guys dressed up with makeup, right. this is not the vibe. We're, yeah, so, and then grunge. Yeah. Well, grunge was was a, was a rebellion against mm -hmm. that too. Be, mm -hmm. And and by the time grunge and I look, look, heard Nirvana, I was like, wow, this is some this honest, this is some real and shit. That was in the nineties, yeah. But by that time, I was far gone. Yeah. I was just like already like I've already kind of made my bed with trying to learn how to play jazz music. And I remember being at at school, like maybe William Patterson in the eighties, and just kind of everyone's plugging into the Roland Jazz Chorus <laughs> and like cranking the chorus. And I'm like, that's cool. I mean, I you know I would go check out Mike Stern and. Of course, all these you know, modern play, current modern players were using that sound in a way, but I kind of felt like uh, people of my generation who I knew we would just sit down with acoustic guitars and we couldn't play. You know, <laughs> you put on the chorus and you can kind of sound like you can sound, you're current. Yeah, and you're I was right. like, wait a second, that's that seems like a shortcut that I don't really want to take because the cats I was checking out, whether it was Wes or Grant Green or Kenny Burrell or Jim Hall or Barney Kessel or whoever. They basically all played a box through an amp. Yeah. Yet they sounded different. Why? Because of their touch, their attack on well, the instrument, their choices, musical choices. And and <clears> I was like, well, those guys aren't plugging in to get a current sound. They all mm -hmm. sound like themselves based on their personality. Even. Mm -hmm. So that's what made you stand out at that time in the in the nineties where everybody was using like reverbs and delays and like all kinds of uh I wasn't trying to stand know, out at all. I was just trying to like I want to learn how to play the instrument with my hands. But you know, right. that was but, the, but and at, I didn't at, even at think I was at the time it wasn't really like that wasn't the thing, I think. And, and maybe until yeah. until you came along well, and, and maybe uh, you know as as that generation. Like Yeah, I think there know, were guys that were are gonna like, reject any hmm. number of whatever when I, when I moved to New York People weren't trying to sound like Kurt. They were trying to sound like you. And then, like a few years later, then they they, they started trying to sound like Kurt, yeah. and including me. I mean, I, I yeah. was hugely influenced by you first. Mm -hmm. I remember. I remember I, hearing I met, you, and you sounded like you had that, you know, like Pat Martino kind of articulation. Yeah, I was. Like I really. When I was in high school, I just was like, I'm just gonna try to play just like Pat Martino. Yeah, I and was then, like, wow, let me get some of that. Like, <laughs> I was, you know, that was just like. And, and then, then I, I didn't hear you for a few hmm. years, and then I remember hearing you. It's like, oh, well, okay, that, you've that been was like out a, some a, a result of like I, I, I heard Kurt, I heard Bill. Fr I got really into Bill Frizzell, yeah. especially yeah. the stuff with Lovano and Paul Motion. That was a great band. And, um, yeah. Like I got more into into yeah. kind of you know textures of of, of of sound of reverbs and and delays and stuff like that. But and also, I feel maybe like the most were... important thing that I did before I did that was like get really into deeper inside of like people who weren't doing that. All right. But you're also smart, like, say, having the instinct to be a musician of your time, <laughs> as opposed to, like, like I maybe felt like I didn't feel like belonging to, like, I don't know, what, what is my generation? What are we? We're just, like, the guys that I was with were, like, looking, looking to, not, not, not an unhealthy reverence mm -hmm. for the past, but just, like, a, a love for it and no, wanting but, to learn the music. Yeah, you know, so, you, so when you got to new school, like you, like you said, there was Brad Meldow, Larry Goldings. Yeah. Uh, those two guys, I mean, extremely like connected yeah. with the past and That's tunes, true. like true. really knowing tunes and yeah. could play changes and yeah. could swing. Yeah. Um, well, swinging was, was, yeah. There were still a lot of guys you could go hear it. You know, you could hear Art Blakey, you could hear Billy Higgins, you could hear the right. great drummer, you could hear Elvin, you know, and, and, and even though this, we all felt we were born way too late, we still got to hear those people. The, <laughs> you know? But like, the thing is that that was post-fusion, post-80s That's true. jazz. Uh, I feel yeah. like to, to bring that back, like there was a, that whole generation of, of musicians that brought... The, I guess the Young Lions movement that kind of brought acoustic jazz back after well, the 70s and the 80s. I don't know if... I mean... It was it was brought back mostly I think I guess in the because of, because of the because of Winton and Bradford yeah. like that yes, was the thing that sure. brought because I remember playing at Augie's and meeting some guys that were ten years older than us we were in our t early twenties and there were some guys that were ten years older than us that really were into bebop and they were kind of like the lost generation because they should have been playing fusion because that was the you know that's what they came up in but they were 
rejected that, and it was really a bad time to be trying to even play straight ahead until, you know, Winton and Brantford came along and there was kind of a resurgence of that, and and I didn't, you know, necessarily feel connected. I wasn't like, oh, mm -hmm. I gotta, you know, be like those guys, but I was just like, oh, that's that's good because. Yeah. You know, they're oh, was those, talking about those stuff. Acoustic bass sounds better. Acoustic <laughs> bass and guys talking about, you know, just like, in, oh, that's great. I mean, we kind of felt like, oh, maybe it's okay to do this, whereas, right. and we kind of felt that's, like, that's why thank I, God we weren't born 10 years before, because we would have kind of really fallen in that where those guys were, I'm sure, outwardly discouraged from doing that because there were just, because there were no gigs for that. There yeah. were still some legends and masters around, and they were probably... You know, I mean, I don't want to say scuffling, but you know, that was like Sonny Stitt was doing that all through up until mm -hmm. uh, you know the mid '80s, just playing like master, just playing with local rhythm sections and do. You know, he wasn't like having any, you know, a career, you know, that was bolstered by a big record company. Mm -hmm. and that wasn't happening for straight ahead jazz until that that so-called Young Lion that, movement. But yeah, I so mean, it was just a weird kind of trend, you know, of, of, of the time, you know. I think a lot of people overlook the fact that <clears throat> the, Bram, the the Marcellus brothers kind of did that in the 80s, which is like, man, people kind of look at Winton now sometimes and they talk shit about him because he's this big public figure and he's the right. face of the Lincoln Center and it's kind of corporate. But man, that is one of the baddest motherfuckers to ever play the instrument. And wow. like those albums in the 80s yeah. are why really like the whole next... The That's '90s true. was so successful. I feel like like people made people sleep to, on that. Yeah, people made it something too. Well, a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, but to some people, I mean, t it depends on your perspective, though. I mean, I mean so, it's a huge part of it. Yeah, um, and and Winton has always talked about the history of of the music. I mean, who put you know the the name Louis Armstrong back out into the you know nobody was he was looked at as like a you know he was a right. guy who was like. I mean, an entertainer, yeah. you know, but at least he put that in perspective, like, no, this is the guy, and it was shown to him, you know, this is the guy who started the music, you know, this is the yeah. guy who taught the world to phrase, taught the world how to swing, and that was the thing, because if you think about those pop tunes were written in the 20s and 30s, they were just like musical theater, they are just yeah. like no, they're just no rhythm, no rhythmic, Yeah. you know, it's it just, <clears throat> there. it was what they were. <laughs> They were written for what they were, which was songs and shows. And Louis Armstrong and then Nat Cole came along and they just like, this music is, these songs are this and so much more. <laughs> you know, yeah. they just put another another dimension to it completely. So so what were you guys, what were you, Brad and, and Larry Goldings, what were you guys doing at New School? Like what was the, I've heard, because I've heard stories of you guys, like uh, at least you and Larry, like how you used to learn tunes and how you would go to the yeah. Library of Congress or, uh, or no, not the just library. Just I mean the, the New yeah. York Public Library. Yeah, you could and just kind of take out fake books. I would go there when I was in high school and just like, it was the, you know, we didn't have YouTube or there was no like downloading music. So I would, mm -hmm. you know, I would buy records, but I would also go because I was reading about so many different people and I couldn't, you know, necessarily afford to go buy everybody's record, but yeah. I would go to the, the library and check out records. I would take them out, and I would come home with a stack, as many of records yeah. as I could, and listen to them. And the ones that I was that really jumped out of me or whatever, this is, I would tape it onto a cassette. So yeah. I had a bunch of cassettes, <laughs> and then I would buy, you know, <clears throat> things. But I didn't, you know, I, I just uh, used the library as like a way to, you know, hear stuff, and then we could also uh, check out fake books and, yeah. Xerox the tunes we wanted, and and uh, so it was just a, it was just we have mu much more uh, access to all this information now. But back then, you just had to, you know, back then get you on the bus and go to the library. Yeah, it, and, but which meant you looked at it. You looked at it, <laughs> yeah, and you, you looked yeah, at it exactly. And now yeah. you can download, you know, three thousand charts in, in that's true ten seconds. You know, that's true, and hear all the music and have like the entire such and such <clears> on your phone, whereas I remember having like 30 or 40 records that I listened to all the time and that right. I knew well, you know. Barry Harris talks about like, we used to have, you know, a 78 would come out and then six months later, so we'd have two tunes to check out. 
Right. And and then six months later, some other stuff would come out and said, "You young guys today, you have all the alternate takes and everything, and you still can't play. <laughs> <laughs> you say you can listen, you can hear every every note they all play, and you still can't get it. You know." But That's hilarious. It, it's something to be said for like if you have a seventy-eight records were three and a half minutes yeah. long, if that, you just you but, knew but those at that three time, minutes. Like, you know, I mean, of course, you write tunes, Larry writes tunes, and Brad writes tunes. But what were you guys playing at in school? Like, were you guys playing standards? Yeah. Or are you some you standards? Playing? And I mean, I think we were trying to play our own tunes as we worked on stuff that we wrote. We would try that out too, but. Yeah, we were learning tunes and tunes by the jazz composers, by Monk mm -hmm. and, and Bird. And uh, getting back to Ted Dunbar, he definitely ha he had a list of tunes that he wanted all his all the cats to check out, and they were all just like on the list for a reason. Even for guitar players, as a, as etude wise, like mm -hmm. Parisian Thoroughfare was that's how you got your triplets together. Right. You know, Prince Albert was for eighth notes, and different tunes were for different things. You had to figure out, in a way, what the lesson was to get from it. But, but, but Dunbar really had like you have to study the music of the cats that yeah. created the music. That's that's this well, is that's, their language, codified and set down, for for posterity. And yeah. those were that was music to study and to learn how to phrase, and then learning about. You well, know, I heard an interview of you talking about how when you write a tune, you you want to write something that. That you hope the band wants to play, like you and you, you. and you, <laughs> like after five gigs or something that you don't get tired of playing. And I think the true judgment of that comes from having played great music in the past. Like if you played all Cedar Cedar Walton and Wayne Shorter and and right. you know Duke Pearson or whoever we're talking yeah. about Monk and and Parker, then you can kind of sort of judge. <laughs> right. You know it, it, it's. It's a kind of a, I call it like educated uh, yeah. decision making. Like, yeah. you know, is your tune, you know, when you're writing something, you, you're kind of the only person that's, that's there right away to, to give it any kind of mm -hmm. de decision. Like, should I bring this to the band? Well, right. you know, should you play that or should you play the music of right. the greats? You know, so. Yeah. Well, that's a dilemma still <clears throat> I'm torn with like, you know, because sometimes if you're playing with people, you want to play to everyone's. Uh, comfort level to some degree just right. because that's going to make the music stronger if people are familiar with the music they can mm -hmm. we can get more into the conversation more into like uh, you know a personal thing when it's one person's tune it, the playing field isn't really level it's like one person wrote right. the tune and other people are <clears> trying to figure it out so people deal with that in different ways as you know as composers and stuff and I, I don't think that you know, if you want to write tunes, that you have to necessarily be great or want to even play the music of Cedar or right. Wayne. I mean, yeah. I want to play it because I love it and I keep learning stuff from those tunes as I play them more and more. But I think the writing of music can be personal and you can write stustuff around your style, write right. stuff to showcase your strengths. And that's good. That's a positive and a creative step is to figure out like, well, I don't sound good playing giant steps so i'm not gonna oh, write a sure. tune like that i'm gonna write a tune that makes it that we're, and that's okay and that's how because ultimately the history of the music is just a history of different characters and personalities right. who lived at different times yeah. and there's always generations every generation has like guys that are out of step with their generation and people that that seem to later exemplify what that generation was about in retrospect mm -hmm. but when you're living it you're just trying to you know, learn the music and figure out what you like. And, and writing is important, I think, for improvisers to write. And I am hearing Wayne Shorter talk about this a little bit. Like, it's just improvisation slowed down. Mm -hmm. You can stop and make your choices and fix it and say, okay, now it's finished. Whereas improvisation is composition in real time. There's no editing. There's no... So I yeah. think, you know, if you want to improvise, you have to study composition because that's kind of what you're doing on the fly when you play. You know? I guess that's what I'm getting to is like a lot of people I feel like skip the studying composition of other of, of the of the masters yeah. and they're just like I'm just going to write my own stuff I don't want to play other people's music but I, I feel like right. that's pretty much impossible if you haven't checked out great music like to where you absorb it like you you really un, you know understand it harmonically and melodically and, and you've absorbed it and you've played it and then 
you can be like, that's not, I'm, I'm hearing something else. Right. But I'm going to well, you, use to, this kind of like. To avoid conventions or right. create new conventions, you have to know what the conventions are. Yes, yeah, exactly. where yeah. we're going to make a different choice. Where guys started writing tunes with Lydian chords. Mm -hmm. Standards don't have Lydian chords. In fact, even, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, Jelly Roll Morton didn't have any Lydian chords. In his, right. Even Ellington didn't, but, you know, Bud Powell did. He kind of had that, you know, but. It's just a learning sounds, but then the Lydian chord, as, as it was taught, you know, by the Berkeley, you know, kind of, <laughs> that's a different thing. So it's just kind of like how you go back and study how certain sounds came to be part of right. the language, you know. Yeah. But I don't know. I just think a composition in jazz world is different because it is, it is about having the tune have enough of a personality, but at the same time be malleable or malleable mm -hmm. so that people can play it and people can bring their own thing to it. It's like the tune, yeah. you know, like a monk tune has its, has a personality, but it, there's still, it's not overwritten to the point where somebody with a strong style can, can play, can't play that and still put their thing on oh, yeah. it, you know, to a degree. You, so you're kind of balancing the respect for the song and also the, the thing that's like, well, this song doesn't tell me that I have to play like monk. It's mm -hmm. just telling me that observe these details, observe these you know, specificities about the tune, but it's not, you know, the form is, is open. It's mm -hmm. not dictating to you what you have to play. So right. that's, that to me is a great example of composition because the tunes have a personality, but they work in lots of different ways too, if you want to do something different with them. You yeah. Know, so. so when, so when did Jim Hall come in the picture, like when you were at New School? Yeah, well, um, he was teaching there, I'm sure, because he lived right nearby, and I'm sure Arnie Lawrence just ran into him on the street <laughs> and said, you know, I have this school around the corner. Why don't you come and teach? You yeah. know, And I think Jim was kind of reluctant as a teacher. He didn't really, because he studied classical composition at, in, in Cleveland, and then he got into playing jazz, and I don't think he, he didn't go to school for jazz, so I think he looked at academia as okay, for classical composition, then you can study that. But for jazz, it was like, like he was of that generation, like, what? You to learn jazz in a school? Like, why? You know, <laughs> like, he learned, he learned to play by playing with, with the elders. And, but I, so he was kind of a reluctant teacher that way he didn't have like a whole pedagogy. He was kind of like, this is what I'm thinking about and this is what I'm kind of, what's important to me, you know. But he was a great teacher in that he just, uh, I think he got into it because he was kind of, you know, just curious what, what young cats were doing. And, and uh, he was just uh, a great teacher in that he just played with us and, and made us sound better than mm -hmm. we were. And I remember feeling like, wow, this is the best rhythm section I ever played with. Like playing a tune or even just a couple of choruses with, with, with Jim was like, wow, he's listening. He's throwing stuff at you and it feels so good that you feel comfortable and you feel, and you also feel beyond like whatever choices he's making to make the music sound good harmonically, rhythmically. He had that Freddie Green feel and mm -hmm. that he would, you know, he was coming from too, but then the harmonic stuff. But it, he just had, he was a great accompanist in that he really was empathetic and generous and wanted to make people sound good. Like yeah. that was his thing. You felt that. So I was like, wow, that's some mystery. You know, maybe you can figure out what the better voicing to play or work on your feel, but then the intangible human element of like what makes somebody a great accompanist was just in full display in terms yeah. of the, uh, that's, that's a human thing. So right. he was a great teacher in that respect, because there was a class of all guitar players and he would comp for all of us. <laughs> and then we would try to comp for him or we would, then he would say, you guys play a duo, then we would play together and sound sad, you know, because we couldn't really play. But when we played with him, it was elevated, you know. I know it's and the same. Is, that, is that all Arnie? How, how did that class, like, how does a class of all guitar players start? Well, I think maybe Arnie was like, I want you to teach a class with all the guitar players, or, you know, and there was like maybe eight or nine guitar players. Because nowadays it would just be like, it feels yeah. like it would be like, just give everybody a private lesson, you know? Right. <laughs> no, it was just a group of us, maybe eight or nine, and, uh, and he would just say, well, you know, let's play this tune, or somebody want to bring it a tune. Every, you know, he would just kind of. It was, it was like he would gently give assignments and stuff like that. Like, when well, you right. bring in a tune, you start one. And so it was just about playing together. And he was very curious as a teacher, too, because 
you know, people in the class, they maybe had one thing that they did that was kind of cool, and Jim would be like, well, what's that? Show, show us that. You know, share that with the class. Right. Like, show me, what, what are you thinking about when you play that? And so, but it was just like he was genuinely curious about what people came up with, and I think yeah. he was really fascinated with how much variety there was in the, the world of the guitar. Like, everyone had a different guitar. Right. And different, you know, what kind of pick do you use? And what, There's so many hmm. variations on how to, you know, make the thing make a sound that he just was kind of amused by it all like yeah. he was just like this is really cool everyone is different and that's you know that was that that was a good thing and he had a great uh a great vibe and that he was positive and and yeah. curious you know it's like wow jim hall is like at that time he wasn't even that old. he was just 60 years old really 19, that's, I mean, 1980 it's not old at 1989 all, like, or 90 yeah. yeah he was born in 30 so he was 60 years old Still playing tennis all the time. He was in great shape, <laughs> and he was just like, "I'm trying to learn stuff from you guys." That right. was his vibe, you know. Yeah. And, that's, uh, uh, that's it was I beautiful. Mean, that's some of the greatest thing about. I mean, yeah. at least for me, also teaching now is like, wow. I mean, the, yeah, these young, they have a different experience with music than that's than, right. than we did or you did or absolutely, um, yeah. yeah. But he ultimately, Jim asked you to play with him. You start playing. Well, with him. I yeah. They, well, there was a. I was lucky that there was a. He got a chance to do a concert in uh, 1990 JVC Jazz Festival. Mm -hmm. It was George Ween JVC Festival at that time. And he did a thing, because he was into tennis, was, he did a thing called the In Jim Hall Invitational, where he played with different people. He played uh, duo with Ron. He played duo with Jerry Mulligan. He played duo with Bob Brookmeyer. He played with his quartet with Gil Goldstein and Terry Clark and Steve mm -hmm. Spita. He had some string quartet piece that he had written, I think maybe started when he was in a student in school yeah. and so there was that and uh and then he played with a bunch of different guitar players uh Schofield was there Ooh. uh Matheny and him played a duet Mick Goodrick and Abercrombie played a duet together and then I played a tune with with Jim and his quartet do you remember what tune. tune it was we played how deep is the ocean <clears throat> oh yeah we started with like a chorus just blowing together me and him in E minor G mm -hmm. and then we went into C minor E flat with the band came in. That's that's what I remember. It was arrangement, <laughs> and uh, it was all over so fast. I was like so like I wasn't even nervous because I was like Whoa. I just couldn't believe I was even there. I was yeah. just like this is too. Tr I'm too tripped out to even be nervous. Like I didn't feel I had anything the, to lose. JVC Jazz Festival was that still in Bryant Park at that time? Like when it was when all I lived over in New the York, city. it was like yeah, it was all over the city. It was this was in Town Hall. This concert oh, was shit. in Town Hall. Oh, that was recorded, right? It was like a it's a record. One, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and somehow I even knew it was being recorded, and I still wasn't even, I don't think I was even smart enough to be nervous. I didn't yeah. even realize it was like some kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be out, I'm going to be on this, like, why that motherfucker? And not so, yeah, you yeah. know, like, like, I didn't even realize it at the time, but I was, you know, I mean, I knew I, knew I was fortunate. I mean, I didn't, don't, I mean, it wasn't lost on me that I was getting an opportunity to play with, with Jim, but I really didn't, I was such a, in my own little world of like i'm just trying to learn how to play and not sound terrible that that that's all i was thinking right. about like how do i not sound <clears throat> terrible and uh i mean but that but that i mean but that but that was like 1990 or something 1990 like that. It was the summer so of then, 1990 and then right after that you start well i got you hit the scene basically well we were that. playing at augie's and the mm -hmm. group with larry and and bill had kind of already started playing gigs and uh we did a couple demos already and then we had got to record a few months later in December of 90, I recorded with Larry. And I recorded with Lou Donaldson in December of right. 92. Right. Because I had met him at Augie's, and he's just like, I'm getting, I'm waiting for Dr. Lonnie Smith to come back from, he was like in Maui or something like that. He had some gig. <laughs> so he was waiting for Lonnie to come back to New York. I said, when Lonnie comes back I, to New York, I'll call you. And we'll get I tried to find those records, but are they out of print? Probably. They're on Milestone. Yeah. I, the first not one was on, called Play not the Apple Right Music. Thing. Yeah, which is like such a Lou Play Donaldson. Right <laughs> How do you even start? It was Lonnie and Bernard Purdy. And that wow. was wild. That's yeah, and crazy. I was like, we're not per like I, you know, knew who he was, but again, I was like, it, I was just kind of like, wow, I'm trying to just tune up and yeah. play. You know, I didn't even think like I was, you know, couldn't even take it in. Like, you know, this is gonna be on a record. You know, I just was like, how do, how does how did you so you met him at Augie's? Yeah, Lou like, would come around Augie's. He would hang out and poke his head in stuff, and yeah, I guess uh, I don't even know. If I mean, if he asked, I'm looking for a guitar player or something like that, and 
I don't know if he was recommended to go up there or if he was just like, but I remember this older drummer, this guy, Ray White. He was an old, old he was back in his 80s back then. Super nice guy. He used to come to the Village Gay Jam session. I remember him telling me once, I, Lou Donaldson's looking for you. I'm like, I just felt so like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. okay. And because uh, I would see Lou it's around. And, yeah, I would see him around. <laughs> and like, That's Lou Donaldson, it's, you know. But I never, I didn't know him at all. And then one night I met him at Augie's and he just said, yeah, I'm going to do a record date. And uh, Bob Porter's got, you know, got me on Milestone for a few records. And I'm, I'm waiting for Liney to come back from, I think he was in Maui or someplace that he was doing some residence gig. Mm-hmm. And then it happened that we played this, you know, we did two nights of recording. It was a nighttime session too at NOLA Studios starting at hmm. like seven at night until wow. like midnight. And then we came back the next night and did it again. It was <laughs> weird. But, and I got to record with Larry and Bill around that same time. So Yeah, that was the, yeah, yeah. 91, kind of 92. Not, not, we recorded in 90, I guess it came out the next year. That light, intimacy of the blue. Yeah. Of the blues. So. And that, since then, that, that trio yeah. has been together. Yeah, at least, at started, least yeah, documented. Started, yeah, that was our first Bill recording. Stewart, Bill Stewart, Larry Jones. Bill Stewart here. was fully formed when I heard him, you know, 1986 at William wow, Anderson. I, mean, I don't want to say fully formed. You could probably say he's gotten better since then, and I would definitely agree, but he already had a thing, like a personality, mm-hmm. conviction, composure, projection of sound. He was there. And yeah. Larry was like that, too. I had met Larry actually before. When I was still in high school, he was like my oldest musical jazz friend. And Larry sounded together when he was 16. Mm-hmm. He could play and you know, impressed the grown-ups. You know, he sounded real. But he was a he, piano player. Piano. He hadn't never played organ until until around that time, until 80, but what, what do you? What made him switch Augie's. to organ? Well, really? Leon Parker had a gig up there at Augie's, and he had started playing with Larry on piano. And they had done some sessions. Jesse Davis was at the new school. Larry was at the new school. And Leon wasn't going to school there, but he was hanging around and met those guys, and he had a gig up at Augie's. And he just, the bass player didn't show up one night or couldn't play that night. And Leon called Larry and said, can you get like a keyboard and play mm-hmm. the bass, you know, <laughs> play, play the bass line on the keyboard. And yeah. So Larry got some Korg, like a two octave Moog thing. Korg was the right hand, one manual. And then the Moog, that's the Moog two octave thing was like the bass. The bass. And he hooked up two keyboards do it that's amp. crazy and that and was changed his, little, his life <laughs> his organ thing you know he just kind of got and he was started listening to some organ records and he was getting into it and yeah we just kind of this is cool because he can control the bass and yeah larry's always been like if it has keys he can make it sound good right you know, he'll make music out of anything with keys yeah it's just like that's 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 his world right there you know? <laughs> and then the couple years i think the next year it was 989 or 90 was when Brad, or maybe it was 91 that Brad came to the school. He was a little younger than us, three years and younger Leon, than me. And Leon, I heard like Brad's original trio, that was kind of like Leon Parker's trio. Leon, well, Brad's, yeah, the original trio with Brad was uh, Leon and Ugana, which ended up becoming Jackie Terrasan's trio because mm-hmm. Jackie kind of got gigs first and then yeah. he kind of took those guys and then, and that's when Brad kind of started playing with. Jorge, first Jorge and his brother Mario, and then he got hooked up with Grenadier. But, but the original Meldau trio was with Leon and Ugana. Yeah. And, uh, yes, long, it does, yeah, long a lot time of, ago. There's a lot of history. But, but it's, and it's different because at the time wasn't that, it's not, it wasn't documented like it is now. There were no cell phone videos and it's like well, there, one, there's there's a video now of, of brad playing with leon at the gate it's at amazing, the gate yeah man. it's so yeah. great but it was just like somebody with like a, a camcorder yeah. like exactly this big yeah, thing yeah. you know there's a video of me and larry and billy drummond playing at the village gate too which oh, was, man. i was like 92 or something and i just look at that and like who is that guy you know it's just yeah. like it's, it's so long ago that you can kind of forgive yourself for whatever you sounded like but it's not as bad as i would have thought because like I said, I don't even think I was, I, I knew enough to really be all that hung up. I was just trying mm-hmm. to play. You know, like you guys were, of, were, I mean, when you met Brad, you guys were, did you start playing right away? or was uh, that kind Yeah, of with up? Brad, we, I mean, sure. He was, but he started playing with Christopher Holiday. Oh, right. Christopher right. Holiday's Man, band. I used Larry to have and, that record. I used to have that record. Larry played in Holiday's band first, and then 
Larry was kind of started getting gigs with John Hendricks. Like I said, Larry could play already. He was already like you could he could do gigs with people. Right. Because he, he just knew. And how Christopher to, Holiday was like this. Holiday like kind was of a, he was part of the Young Lions player. thing. Yeah, he was kind of he had a he had a record deal and gigs and everything, and he had a band. Took him on yeah. the road. Yeah, yeah, it was wild. But kind of disappeared like after a second, right? Well, he was he's he's uh, he made a few records and then, yeah, that was the problem with like, you know, getting that major label mm -hmm. backing is that if it was taken away, then, you know. It was too, it was, you know, but he ended up moving out of the city. He ended up, he's on the West Coast now, Christopher Holiday. Oh, okay, He plays cool. gigs, he's doing his thing. Well, but it's just like, yeah, it was a funny thing of, cause I remember he was on RCA Novus and so was Roy Hargrove. Yeah, he came to exactly, town and yeah. he, I remember talking, I remember being like in a Donald Byrd ensemble and he was the instructor of this ensemble at the new school and it was Christopher Holiday and Roy Hargrove and, me and Goldings, I think. Maybe wow. it was Brad. I don't know. It was, I, don't, I don't remember who else. Roy but went to New School. Roy was at the New School for a I minute. Didn't know but that. he was already starting to make records, and he was on RCA too. And so was Chris Ferrality. So I remember t them talking before the class, like, oh, yeah, you, and, and they hadn't met yet. Oh, you're on RCA. I'm, yeah, when, when's your record coming out? Oh, next, you know, next month. When's your record coming out? <laughs> so Donald Burr was sitting there, and he's like, <laughs> well, since we're all so distinguished, maybe we can get started and play some music. <laughs> you know, it was like, <laughs> like I got a little bit of a, it was, it was with love, but it was like, uh, we were thinking like, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's Donald so Burr. Funny, He's not going to be impressed by some punks with it. But he, I know he loved Roy. And, and, you know, of course, you know, Roy was like a young guy, and you know he kept he kept it all he kept it going. You know, yeah. Roy was just like he was the youngster, and then after a while, he was the the elder hiring the young right. cats in his well, band. That, that's the thing that I feel like it maybe is a little bit missing today. Is that I, and I still remember when I moved to New York, it was like people in school were already touring. They were already on records. Yeah. Like yeah. everybody that I was going to school, not everybody. Well, you but came there was up like, with a very distinguished group. Yeah, I like I of. moved to school, like Ollie Jackson was there. He was he was at the school, but never there. There was a lot of people right. that were going to new school that but already too big. you would never yeah. ever see because they were right. on the road. They were on all these records. Right. And um, like it was a thing, like when I got to new school, I was like, well, half the, the students are already on the scene. They're already, right. you know, it's like, it was like kind of a, and today it's like a different yeah. whole world. Like it's just it's just Instagram. <laughs> it's Instagram, and yeah, I guess. Well, but the major, yeah. I mean, that label thing is it's gone. I feel like it, it kind of. Well, the major right. label thing. That's why Roy was able to play at the Vanguard with his group. Right. I remember yeah. going to like check out Roy at the Vanguard. Like when he was there with he had he had Greg Hutchinson and and uh, he had a great band, you know. And I was and that was the first time I got to play at the Vanguard. You know, Roy was like. Yeah, you want to come sit in on Sunday night? We're gonna have some guys play. Yeah. And so I like lugged my amp down. It's like <laughs> I was freaked out to play at the Vanguard just to play a tune. And I remember learning Firm Roots on mm -hmm. the spot. Like I was like, oh yeah, I've heard people play this tune. And then it's like, oh, I'm I'm playing this tune now. Like okay, right. I better figure out what the hell is going on. But I remember getting through a couple choruses at the Vanguard. Just like that feeling of like. But Roy was already there. He was like even younger than me by a couple of years, maybe. But he just had so much composure. He's like, yeah. here he is, like leading his band at the Vanguard. And, but he was able to do mm -hmm. it because of because we were playing up at Augie's. We were playing yeah. gigs, but it right. wasn't the Vanguard. Roy yeah. was able to like, you know, have that, you know, incredible sense of, you know, how to communicate and everything. And right. and and uh, he was a kid, but he was, you know, he was dealing. And he, you know, he came in like that. You know, mm -hmm. came in playing at the Vanguard. And <laughs> that's so, crazy. Well, speaking it's of major deep. labels, uh, yeah. so <laughs> Criss Cross. Criss Cross. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I love Criss Cross. Me uh, too. But, I mean, 1992, Mel Ryan, was that your first Criss Cross record? It was record 91 date? I got to play with Mel. Okay. The first Criss Cross date was with Brian Lynch. Oh, That's wow. actually okay. how I met Mel because Brian Lynch was bringing Mel uh, from Milwaukee, where he still lived. That's where Melvin and uh, that's where Brian and David Hazeltine, all those guys, Met Melvin was in Milwaukee because he lived there forever. Mm -hmm. So Lynch had a date on Criss Cross, and he had Kenny Washington and Ralph Moore and Melvin. And then I think Melvin was like, "Well, who's going to play guitar?" You know, because Melvin, like, you know, yeah, he he was you know played organ, but when he played organ, he wanted to have a guitar. Right. And so Brian was like, "I don't know, I don't have a guitar player." And so that's how I remember I was playing at the gate. I think I was playing at the gate with Brad and Weber, John Weber and mm -hmm. Jimmy Cobb. And I remember Brian Lynch came in with Teakins, 
and he's like, yeah, we have this record date like Monday or something, or the rehearsal's Monday and the record date's Tuesday, and that was like Sunday, Saturday night or something. So can you can you be at this rehearsal on? I'm like, sure, I know Melvin Ryan. The Melvin Ryan is like, you know, it's like, so I was, you know. Right. But that was Criss Cross, and I had, I had heard of Criss Cross because I had seen some of their records, and, but I had never met Teakins, and that's how I got into the Criss Cross because they, they, I mean, they came to say, okay, well, this guy could play guitar on the date. And so right. we did Brian's date, and then Teakins was like, maybe it was a little bit in the works, but he said, uh, can you guys come back tomorrow? Just a trio, and I want to. I want Melvin to make a record, you know. And so me and Kenny was, were on it just because we were on Brian's date. It mm-hmm. wasn't like Melvin wow, picked us. Okay. So it was so just like a total. Happened. And that was the legend, right? That, Mel, that was that his first, first record. Yeah. That was complete, uh, just um, you know, luck to have been there to, wow. to, to make Melvin's records. Because whoever was on Brian's date would have been on <clears> Melvin's <throat> date. So that was the beginning of of Chris Cross. And, then, and you and did. Then, the next year, five or six records with, with Melvin? Melvin. Yeah, a bunch. He would bring Melvin back every every couple of years <clears throat> to do a record date. Yeah, and some of them were just well. That was the only one that was trio. The next one, a couple of years later, I think, or maybe it was just the next year, ninety three, had Josh on it, Joshua Redman, mm-hmm. and he had he was big because he had just won the Monk thing. He was just yeah. starting out on his thing, and so it just uh, yeah, Melvin did a bunch of records, and that luckily was the beginning of an association with. Uh, with with Teakins and then Criss Cross and he let me do my own record, which I wasn't really ready to do, but in ninety two and I and I got Mel Dow and Weber and yeah. and Cobb, you know. <clears throat> Something so, burning, right? Something's burning. Yeah. <laughs> Something's burning. Something's burning. <laughs> yeah. I ever seen Junior hey, Cook. Pizza, I want some blues <laughs> and a, a bun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a, the great Jerry Teakins. I mean man, yeah, so he, many uh, records. He did a lot of good you know, stuff there, for a lot of people and let people record their own music and encourage them to mm-hmm. do their own thing. He wasn't any kind of... He prided himself on, I'm not like a major label. I let people do yeah. what they want. And and so I remember feeling very lucky <clears throat> and you know, just to be able to do that when we got a chance to do our own thing, but also just because I got to do a lot of side mandates. Man, you did a ton. And yeah. some, some of the, like... One of my favorite records, my favorite Criss Cross records, is the Walt Weisskopf record. Yeah, that he got Larry and Bill and me, yeah. It was like, what, 95 or something like that? I don't 90, even think so. It was that late. World, you, Larry. Oh, really? By 95, I already had my L5, and I know that <clears throat> I played my 175 on Walt's record. That's the 175? Yeah, yeah for sure. So, oh, um... It was about 93, I think. I could be wrong. Okay. But... It says 95 on, uh... When it came out, yeah, maybe, we, but it, but maybe that's when it was released. It could have been '94. Yeah. He could have recorded in '94. <clears throat> but I that record, man, he wrote some oh great tunes. God, he wrote some hard ass tunes. Yeah, and Walt sounds incredible. He does. And, and you he and does. Larry and Bill are just killing. He was the only guy that like said, "Oh, you guys kind of sound like a band. You want to be on my record?" You know, that was kind of <laughs> yeah. like, "Yeah, we're." It. No, yeah. that's me and Walter Smith. Walter Smith talks about that record. Walter all the time, Smith, too. yeah, and, uh, right on. I remember. I I can't remember who heard that record first. If it was me or Walter, but yeah. it was definitely like kind of either our senior year. No, I think it was freshman year of college, at where new we were checking that new school. Yeah, at oh, you new went school. To some, you went to but new school freshman. I went to new school. Walter went to Berkeley. To Berkeley. Right, right. And Walter was a year younger than me, so he was still in high school. Wow. Yeah, so he wow. was a senior, and we went to the same high school. But like, right. we were both checking He's that record. He's a Texas out. guy too. I didn't yeah. realize that. No, it was definitely. I bought that record at Tower Records. That's funny, yeah. man. Wow. Yeah. So Chris so. Cross got to Tower Records in. Uh, oh, Chris Ross was all all yeah. over Tower Records. In New York, though, you didn't get that. The, you didn't find that in Texas, did you? It, it, I'm sure it was at the Austin. There was one wow. in Austin wow. because I remember driving from Houston to Austin just to buy records. Wow. That's because there was no man. Tower Records in Houston, but what we did have was a place we had Borders. Right. And before that, it was a place called Planet Music. And Planet right. Music was basically Tower Records. Right, right. And you could listen to anything. You could open any right. CD you want and then, you know... And listen to And it. just leave. Wow. Like, literally just cut it open. There was listening stations. They had 14 CD players, I remember. Wow. 14 CD players. You can sit there with a, a, a pack, a, a, a stack of CDs. And decide Listen to them to all and just leave. And yeah. But I would go, I would listen to like, you know, seven records and buy three of them or something right. like that. You that's know. amazing. I, man, I've discovered so much music like that. Wow. That's and I would just cool. get stuff based off the cover and the tune yeah. and who was yeah. on the record. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, um, I discovered you, well, I heard you play with, with Josh. That's when in, I, the first time I heard you in play. In Houston. Yeah, you yeah. played with Josh. 
1990. I remember that. 96? Uh, it must have been 96. Because it was right before... Yep. Yeah, 96, that's right. When I was it was before I moved to New York, and it was before I had auditioned for New School. Right. Um, we played it like... Uh, Rockefellers. Rockefellers yeah. in Houston, yeah. And so that's uh, when I met you, and then Peter Martin. Yep. I was talking to you, and then I started talking to Peter Martin, and Peter was like, oh, have you checked out Peter's records? And I, or, you know, you both huh. have the same name. So, wow. uh, have you checked out Bernstein's records? I was like, no, I haven't. He was like... Yeah go check out his newest one. And I was like, okay, that that's was, when I went and bought Signs of Life. That's right. Because that had just come out yeah, that's right. like a year before or something. And I was like, oh, shit, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and then I remember oh, yeah. moving to New York. Our, our coming, I remember the flight to New York wow. to where me and Glasper, we came to, to New York together to look for an apartment. Wow. And I remember listening to that record at that time. That's so funny. Yeah, <laughs> so it was like so 97. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. So yeah. me, Glasper came up here for like a, a week. We wow. stayed with our friends in Astoria and uh, we went to Smalls for the first time and all wow. of a sudden. It was we already, went, yes, right. Smalls was from 94. Yeah, Smalls yeah. was open. We went to the knitting factory, went to a bunch of places and then we went back to Houston and then we came to, wow. you know, That's we didn't incredible. find an apartment. We ended up both staying in the dorm the first year. And so... But yeah, that's what I was listening to. I was listening yeah. to that Signs of Life and, and a bunch of other stuff. But wow. that, yeah, that was like my introduction into New York City was like you, Brad. Oh, yeah, um, that's amazing. That, that was a lot, uh, Mark Turner's records. Yep. That was a lot yep. of stuff I was checking out yep. at that time. Yeah. Yeah, great, wow. all great fucking time. And all, all the Nicholas, stuff. like Nicholas Payton yeah. stuff. And like, um, yeah. Yeah. That's and a lot. Great. So yeah, a lot of crisscross records. Yeah. Yeah. But Signs of Life is, uh, I mean, now is, I'm sure. Even it's, it's funny to think of Crisscross as like having these classic records, but they are. But it's like yeah. it, it's only funny because I, I have Crisscross records. Right. Um, but yeah, there's man, that's a classic it fucking record, man. And all those Mel Ryan records, like I was just yeah. listening to them yesterday, and I was like, this is fucking yeah, classic, Mel's, Mel's classic, man. classic yeah. organ trio records. Yeah, Mel had a real way of beautiful feeling in this the way he phrased melodies and the way he, his lines just super hip like i could just think of like the real indianapolis sound mm -hmm. think about the kind of hipness like yeah. west freddie hubbard you know I that mean, kind of slide yeah. have to like the indianapolis was like high level of subtlety and sophistication but also you know yeah as down home <clears throat> as it as it gets yeah. also you know so it's but I moved up JJ, here. JJ, you know, yeah. that was, Indianapolis had quite a history of, of, of giants, you know. Man, I didn't but, really know that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those guys were from there. But those yeah. records are, are so killing, man. Yeah. Oh, no. No, and, um, but when I moved here, uh, I was, uh, I, I, my first semester or maybe second semester, yeah. I took lessons. I remember that, yeah. I remember yeah. meeting at the school. The new school was new then. Yeah, the it was, was actually new. the new. Yeah. I remember was, telling people I went to new school. They were like, which one? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. no, it's called the new school. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but you were teaching there, and uh, I think I saw your name, or we were able to request like right. whoever we right. wanted, basically. Right. That was one of the really cool things about new school. It was like, you can request anyone. Right. Anyone that was like willing to teach you, right. you can, that wasn't right. a student at the new school, you could study. That's with. right. When I was and a student so, there, they had things that were like, pieces of paper that were like lesson forms that mm -hmm. were worth money. They were worth $50. Like you had the, the teacher, you would give them to the teacher, the yeah. teacher would bring them to the office of the new school and they would pay them $50. <laughs> like That's bank, crazy. You know, you had to sign it. So you had 10 lesson forms and you could just give them to basically anyone in the school. I like can't remember how it worked when I was... No, I don't think it was more of like whatever, a sign yeah, they, up they sent you a check. Yeah. yeah, but... You didn't go there and get cat. <laughs> no, it wasn't like, like that. That was that was when I was a student. It was like that, and but that's that's true. You could uh, you could request your, your own teacher, and then yeah, when I was there, you could just whoever yeah you signed the form, they had to give fifty dollars. Yeah, so I studied. I was for. studying with Vic Juris. Right. I might have yeah, just. I might have, might have just studied with Vic my first semester, and then mm -hmm. I think my second semester, which yeah. would have been nineteen ninety eight. I just remember getting together and playing <clears> tunes with you, like wow. Yeah. The 86th I don't know Street. What to say? 86 in Columbus, in my place. bro. Yeah, 86. My, my <laughs> the place second forever. floor, 2R. Yeah. 2R. 2R. Yeah. I still remember, man. Yeah. <laughs> that long flight of stairs up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was lucky. It's so funny, and I think of you sometimes because I remember, like, you know, after each lesson, I would be, I would, you feel like you kind of want to hang 
and then yeah. you would, you know, we'd be talking at the door, and you would just be like, "All right, yeah, the lesson's over." <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no, no, but it was like in the <laughs> nicest way, and I, I find myself doing that sometimes. It's like the student, <laughs> they, they just want to like have a little bit of a conversation after the lesson. I'm like. I just need to be by myself. <laughs> like, yeah, I think it was probably like my girlfriend was probably coming home. It's like, you yeah. have your student out of there by the time I get yeah, home man. from work. You know, it was a little... <laughs> no, it, it, could be, like... it could be a million different things, but it's just like, yeah, man, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was fun, but you got to go. Uh, I don't ever, ever, ever... I remember teaching you at the school, like going down to the school and just like hanging in a room and just like, well, I have no idea what I could be teaching this guy, but uh, oh, man, you know, it's no, fun to play. You know? I remember distinctly playing darn that dream with you and you correcting me on the changes which which needed huh. to happen huh. uh, and but i think most of the stuff we played we would just play tunes and you would yeah. just kind of just be like you know this chord you could play this chord or that right. chord is actually this chord right um and this is the melody and stuff like that because right. i was so loose on on melodies and stuff like that back then yeah. you know, i was kind of half-assed learn the melodies and just want to blow over stuff right and it you know but it it, it was a quick kind of like you know like you gotta yeah Whatever there's tune details, you're learning, don't details, don't yeah. don't skip the little details. Yeah, I remember Harold May when he used to talk about that all the time, like the endings of tunes, like what are the oh, last yeah. three notes of the yeah. melody? Like everybody kind of <clears throat> always kind of spaces on and, that. But yeah. and I remember for sure being at your place one time, and and that was when you got the Zeidler. Wow, I and really, that's amazing <clears throat> that you were right there. And you were just like, man, I don't I don't know, man, like. Like just play it. Tell me what you think. And I played, and I I remember playing the L five, and I got like chills. Like uh -huh. I was like, this is incredible. Like, yeah. And then you handed me the Zeidler, and I played it, and <clears throat> I love the low register. Right. I was like, the low register is like I've yeah. never felt anything yeah. or heard anything yeah. like this. And then I was like, but the high register of the L five at that time right. was like, I was like, this is it could have been, yeah. this is the and shit. I was like, I can't spend more time. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't I was make like, a I can't tell you. And yeah. and it's funny, like now I would be like, let's go for the low register, you know. Right. But like, at that time I was like, I don't know, I don't know what to yeah. tell you, man. I love tough. your L five, but this is yeah. also it has a vibe in the low register. And you yeah. were like, yeah, man, I, I just, <laughs> you're so I like was on the fence. You're like, yeah, I could tell. And and then you ultimately chose to go with the Zeidler, yeah. which is like now, I mean, that's 1998, man. Yeah. Well, how many, is that 24 years? 20, yeah. Yeah. I've had this year, 24 years. How yeah. is that guitar, the guitar all the touring, made, all, how is yeah. it still in shape? Like It's what? a lot more banged up, but it's still <clears> together. It's got better over the years because the wood has just dried out and opened yeah. up. It's like, there's no way that it sounds anything like it did oh, no, 22 no. years. Yeah, for sure And not. the guitar was already... Uh, let's see, 16 years old. In that, mm -hmm. It was made in 81. So the guitar is, you know, 40 plus years old now. So it's... Yeah. The other thing I remember about that time was you had just recorded Earth Tones. Okay. That and is you, seven. right, right. And I came over and you had a, 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 prom, a promo box. Oh, wow. Uh, That's of, right. Tegan. But not of Earth Tones. You had a promo box of Brain Dance. Oh. And you're like, hey, man. Uh, that was first. You yeah. gave me a, yeah. that record. And it was like one of the promo wow. copies. Oh, you're like, oh man, this, you know, this is my new record. And it was like, it's but like the new get, one. But then you were like, trying like, to get you out of the like, <laughs> yeah, you're record, like, just get the fuck out of here. Just take <laughs> <Yeah>. this. <laughs> and then, and then, but you were like, but my new record, I just recorded. And you're like, you said, I'm really excited about it, and I haven't listened to it. You said, I, I, I haven't listened to it because it yeah. felt so good when we recorded it. Like I couldn't. I couldn't get myself to listen to it because I felt it would ruin it, and that stuck with me. Like I was like, "Well, I'm, I have to say, I don't listen to shit whether it felt good or felt <laughs> bad." I, I just so kind of just like I don't. Like a... I never listened to anything, but I, I was surprised. I was like, I was excited about it. And no, you were, the date you, went, you were like, I felt smooth. really good about yeah. the date, and then and you're saying, like, so I have haven't listened fast. to it because you, you didn't want to ruin that feeling that you had <laughs> right. just had after recording it. And I, I know that, you know. I still have never listened to it, so it's cool, yeah. <laughs> but I just remember being like, I can't wait for that record to come out, because I, I want to because you were like, I don't like this, you were not excited about brain dance. I didn't like my point, yeah. I mean, I had a, it was a tough date, you know, for me, yeah. just like, I was, was like one of those days where you're trying to record, and you're like, right. in your own head, and, uh, not, yeah. and not feeling good about how you played. So you were like, I'm, and. I'm not into this, but then I went home and checked out Brain Dance, and then I was like, "Oh, he's really you know, like he wasn't into this, but he's really excited about the next record." I was like, <laughs> yeah. "I can't wait for the next record." And of course, it was killing that. That record is, is yeah, that was well. We had been playing a lot as a group already, so <clears throat> by that time, so we felt maybe felt more like we had playing. We're playing stuff that we had played, or things came together. Right. I think with the Brain Dance, I remember I was trying to add the horns, and I didn't feel like I really 
wrote enough stuff. You know, I was just like, this is too rushed, you know? Yeah. Like, I just kind of didn't have the right And the other, I remember at that time, you were also playing with Jimmy Cobb. Yeah, well, when, we, yeah, it could have been. I mean, we played you know, off, throughout all those years, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't even know, by 98, maybe we weren't even, I don't even know if Brad was still playing with us. Maybe he was already. Was, I went to go see you guys, and, and you probably remember the name of this place, but I don't remember. I just know that me and Glasper went to see you with Jimmy Cobb. Wow. <clears throat> and it was in Times Square, somewhere like 41st Street. Oh, yeah, Street. that was that Savoy, that place. Yeah. No, not that Savoy. Was what it was called. No, it wasn't called Savoy. It was called, uh, it was in... Was it Richard Wines? Or Richard Wines was yeah. probably playing piano. John Weber. Yeah, it was this club on the, right in the kind of the underbelly of Port Authority. Yeah, exactly. Was it called Savoy? Maybe it was Savoy. I think yeah, it was called yeah, Savoy. Yeah, Savoy, yeah. And I remember me and, and, and Robert went place, there. yeah. And we got off the train and we were walking like, you know, on the side of Port Authority. We were like, this shit is sketch, yeah, man. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Ninth Avenue and 41st yeah. Street at yeah. that time. Was it like, was a little... Yeah. I mean, it wasn't the 70s, but it still wasn't... It's no. not today. No. It's not... Yeah. We were like, oh, I don't that know, That was man. kind of a like, fucky place. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> Weber, Weber kind funky. of found that place. He, it, I mean, everything yeah. seems extremely funky when you're not from... Like, you were born in New York, which yeah. I, I, I totally yeah, skipped over yeah. and forgot to ask you about, but like... You you were born here, man. Like where where did you grow up? I grew up on the Upper West Side. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, right near where I where I where the place you came. I lived in yeah. that same neighborhood, and uh, I went to high school around there. And yeah, I mean that was from like uh, yeah eighty nineteen eighty one or so eighty mm -hmm. nineteen eighty we lived there. Wow. In that in that area, so I grew up. Yeah, and the Upper West Side was much different than it. I mean, you it never... was a little. Yeah, it wasn't sketchy right, by any means, but there were, you know, I I got some bikes stolen from me in those <laughs> days, you know, as a young punk, and uh, but yeah, it wasn't a, but it, Upper West Side wasn't like it is now. The Upper West Side now is like the Upper East Side. Yeah, <laughs> back, back then, then. it's like, but uh, but there was, you know, yeah, I, I, Freddie Bryant lived. He grew up like a block away from me. Hmm. And I think Adam Rogers lived on like yeah, Adam. He grew from up there. in like ninety second. Yeah. So there's a few of us from New York, and yeah, I mean, it was just, I don't know what it's, I can't compare growing up so, here to another place, because I don't know anything <clears throat> really You were different, never tempted you know? to leave? Not I really, not. once been, I got, in, once I got into music, once I got into music, I realized New York was the place for music. I mean, as soon as I wanted to go hear music, when I was in right. high school, I would go hear things, and right. yeah, it was, it was great. You I never realized. sought the California sun, man? Nah, it was a great place to visit, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I love it there, but music in New York is yeah of course, you know, of course. It's the biggest concentration of it's just most. funny for me to think of someone like you like just born here like you it's like you're meant yeah. to be here man you're it's meant weird. to fucking be playing every night like well, <laughs> in this I mean, city yeah or Hutch, or, Hutch or was touring from here. Hutch is Hutch from is Brooklyn from... Ari Rowland is from mm -hmm. he's in the village and Sammy Hell had... also is Sam, Sam no Sam grew up he grew up in a bunch of different places he came to New York to the new school okay to like you know a little bit after because around that time, you know, Jimmy, I saw you play with Jimmy. I saw you play yeah. with Sam at Smalls. Sam, we used to play with Brian, that's right. Yeah, that was when Brian I first Blake. got my Zeidler. Yeah. We were playing at, uh, down. I remember doing, like, the first time I, I got the guitar, I was, like, playing with Sam, and we got Brian to come and do a little session at Sam's when he used to live on 10th Street, right mm -hmm. there where Mesro is now, and down to the basement. And, like, I had, a, like, a Walkman or something and just right. recorded because I wanted to hear what the guitar sounded like. Right. We were playing, like... <clears throat> a couple tunes like Punjab and some tunes with Sam and Brian just recording it. So I got to record. I, gotta I remember this. you guys yeah. playing that tune. Yeah, got to hear how this guitar sounds. You know, <laughs> and I kind of got into it. Yeah, that's that was that was that same time. Yeah, ninety eight. I mean, that was probably. And I talked to Nicholas Payton about this, and it could be feeling like that just because it was coincidence of that's when me when I moved to New York. Yeah, but I I also think that was just like one of the most special times in, yeah in in, in in the history of the music here because i mean you know well, brad was like on his like you know just hit the scene brian blade right. was starting the fellowship you were That's playing right. with sam you were playing with josh yeah. and well sam you and josh well josh and, i mean sam had got a band with josh after josh yeah, it was either, either be the, you or Josh with with Blade at Smalls. Right. Oh, that's yeah. right. With with yeah. Sam's. Right. That's right. So Sam's trio that's would right. either have Josh or you. That's right. And that was happening. Kurt was playing every Thursday. That's right. That's when he like put that. that band with Mark and Jeff Ballard and Ben Street together. Yeah. 
And it was, and and you know, then you know, Bill uh, Frizzell would be at the Vanguard with, yeah. with Lovano and Paul Motion for two weeks it's or something. Funny, shit like it's that. funny, but it was just so much yeah. stuff. And Nick was playing the Vanguard, and yeah. like Kenny Garrett had like mm-hmm. was fucking on was top of his game at that yeah. time. Yeah. So much music, <clears throat> and I was like, some of that I relate to. Okay, I was fresh in New York, but I yeah. think we just got lucky. Yeah, like could we be. just we arrived at one of the like most killing times to be in New York City. Yeah. I, I I mean it's hard for me to think of it that way, but yeah, I mean, because I always you know, and still feel this way, although less so now that I'm getting older. But just felt like, man, I missed so much. I was born too late. I was born <laughs> at the wrong time. I never right. got to hear this guy and this guy and this guy and all these people and. You know, God, I wish I could have heard Billie Holiday and all. You know, like, you just kind of go back to, like, way before your time and just feel, like, a frustration. But then you meet people that are younger than you and they say, wow, you were lucky to... And then you say, well, I guess I, you know, I, you have no sense of, like... <laughs> you, you don't know until you... you someone know. told me they, they moved to New York and, like, I moved to New York in 2002. I'm like, in 2002, I was already <laughs> reminiscing about the old days. Yeah. You know, like, that makes me feel old, like... It, by then, when you first were coming here, I was already like, oh, man, it's not the way, it, you know, so yeah. just, I, mean, I wasn't old, <clears throat> but it's just all your perspective. But that, that is good that you feel like you came to New York at a time where there was no, some, it was a special some time. fertility and, and that, you know, that, that you. I feel like that's part of the reason yeah. why you have some of the guys from my generation that have are still around, like making great music the strickland brothers and glasper yeah, of course like when we came we were just so inspired right like by the music that was happening that there was just no way that well, we couldn't right but you could I also mean, say guys of your talent level there was no way you weren't gonna not be who you were no matter what there it was, was. Like, it you was would a just... mix of like yeah we could play and there was some natural ability there but it was just like there was also just there okay was... we came at a time where yeah. we were ready to right. soak up everything that was right, happening right 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 yeah mm-hmm. I mean, it's just hard for me to conceive of like as someone who's seek, seeking out inspiration seeking out something to relate to what i'm doing to have any tiny fraction of the you know <laughs> like immediacy and power of right. the stuff that you know so for someone to you know think that you're part of a time that was that had some inspiration it's like you can't right. really conceive of it i mean i, just I remember, always feel like a student like a you know you know like well just, it's funny to me to think about how how young everybody was because when i when i moved to new york and of course you you know yeah. i was i was 18 right but i was every, 30 and already. you were 30 yeah you, I, I went to smalls on your 30th birthday that's right you were at the bar i walked into the bar and i looked <laughs> I, to, I walked into the club and i looked over to the left and it was you and josh redman that's funny and i think maybe sam was there or or, or um Joel Strasser or somebody right. was there, and and uh, and they announced that today is uh, Peter yeah. Bernstein's birthday. Everybody wish wow. Peter a birthday. It's his thirtieth birthday, and I was like, oh shit, Peter's thirty. Old. And at that time, I was like, that's I old. got a lot of time, you know. Yeah. And then when yeah. I hit thirty, I was like, fuck. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I remember when Peter yeah. was thirty and how much great music that, that you had already made. But like but I was, say, when we met Jim Hall in 1989, he was 59 years old, that's and crazy. he seemed old because yeah. he was on old records. Exactly. Even yeah. then, there were old records being 25 years old, like 62 was that was, whatever. But yeah, I mean that's the well, thing. that's that doesn't seem old now. <clears throat> Believe me, 59 is you know that's right around the corner. So I can't think of. You know, and he didn't seem like an old guy, but I was like, "Wow, he's old," because he was around in the fifties, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, like in the sixties. So your your perspective but is. But now off we're around in the nineties. Yeah. So that makes us. So old. now, like fifty nine, like or you know, sometimes I I look at photos of in the eighties of Herbie. Yeah. You know, those guys are like forty three, and they're like that. they're like my age. Right. I was like, they had already changed music three exactly. times. Exactly. You know, <laughs> like I was at that concert that when Blue Note came back in 85. <clears throat> yeah. I was a senior in high school, and you know there were all these guys, and the oldest guy there was like Art Blakey or something, or, mm-hmm. Lou, or maybe Art Blakey was older than Lou. Yeah, Art Blakey was born in like 17 or something like 16 even. Yeah. So Art Blakey was like, you know, nearing 70 at, right. in 1985 or whatever. And he seemed, you know... But everybody else was like, you know, Tony was like oh, 40, yeah, you know, yeah. like young. They yeah, were young. And they young. had all, like you say, they had already had such 
an impact. So, I mean, but I look at it as like, well, those guys, you know, besides being giants, they just also lived through this time. And, you know, and the I time, mean, every, uh, yeah, yeah, everything changed. I mean, politically, like, yeah. you know, it was like, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was more than music. It was like just like social, you, you know, civil yeah. rights and like everything. We're living like through some shit now, though, that's for sure. That's, you know, oh, yeah. going to like rival <clears throat> anything, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. But yeah, can you imagine? And also just think of the time frame, like Miles, you know, he had that bad. I mean, Tony played with him from what, 63, you know, five years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's it. Well, that's the thing is, like, when when people tell me now, they're like, oh, I've only been playing jazz for, like, eight years. You know, I'm still starting. I'm like, wait, what are you, what are you yeah. talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. a lot can happen in eight years, man. That's like, sure. Tony was third, you know, it's like, before he played with Miles, he was nine. Eight years before playing with Miles, he was nine. <laughs> like, crazy. so, eight years is a long time. That's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, wow, but, man. Yeah. But you got to play, man, but... Um, are there any, what what were those guys like? What, what was, um, I mean, especially like Lou Donaldson, what was, did you guys rehearse for any of those record dates? Not really. No. I oh, mean, like, he would just kind of bring basically us just go in the studio. Yeah, I mean. He but would, he was cool. Like, he, and of course, we've all heard the stories, at least yeah, like Lewis, musicians. And I don't yeah. know if anybody out there yeah. has heard all the great, great Lewis, uh, I mean, uh, Lou Donaldson quotes. Yeah. We could we could yeah. we could rip off a few of them, but yeah. I did. But I definitely remember his quotes were so good that if you heard them once, you would never forget them. That's like, true. Because yeah. I went to see you guys at the Vanguard, and yeah, like when he was like, "There's gonna be," he was like, "You know, welcome everybody, ladies and gentlemen, to the Village Vanguard. There's gonna be no fusion, no confusion." <laughs> That's right. There's going to be no G's, no Najee's, no Kenny G's. <laughs> and the, yeah. those are the two that I'll just his, never uh, forget. It's like yeah. you hear them once and it's like, how could you ever forget that? Such a character. And you said a yeah. couple of earlier today that it was yeah, like, he had that some were great funny, ones, man. Yeah. And it's like, oh, man. Yeah. But he, he, was, he never messed with the guys in the band. Like, I guess if you're in the band, he didn't really. Not, no, I mean, yeah, not really. Not really. My favorite is like the, the Coltrane. When Coltrane was at the Vanguard and he goes to Lorraine, he was like, you got the wrong idea. You should be charging people to get out, not to get in. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That was about Coltrane he said that? I yeah. Think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it was, it was or maybe it's... Like, I mean, he had a unique, was... unique perspective on the music because for him, like, and the way he used to talk about, like, what the scene was, and Lonnie, you know, Lonnie Smith corroborated this, like, there was a circuit, you know, of mm -hmm. all these organ clubs, and you could kind of stay out. as long, You could just call up ahead a couple of weeks and decide to stay out you want to stay out another couple of weeks then you know like you could just kind of extend your yeah and it was like just the idea of like how much those guys worked they would drive to places and then they would stay there for a week or two and, right. and play. you know it wasn't like every night one nighters which they did a fair amount of too but there was a circuit where and and if you look at old posters of like even like the keystone corner like people were there for weeks or two weeks right you know and it was like a you know common thing and now that's almost gone like a week-long gig you know mm -hmm. so but there was and and, and those you know, Lou used to say like cl places like philadelphia there were 15 clubs great clubs yeah you know where there were great musicians playing and the music but there was just so much music around that it really fed my thing of like you know it's hard to get just to get excited about what's happening at smalls because it was like yeah as great as smalls was and glad we had it <clears throat> it was still like Man, you missed it. Right. I mean, I don't. If I had a nickel for every time Dr. Lonnie Smith said, "Man, you missed it," oh, you would have loved it. You oh, know, yeah. you would have loved those days. So it's hard not to, not to, you know, right? Feel like, oh well, glad for what's still around. But and now what's still around has become what's not. What was still around then is like what's not even around anymore. So mm -hmm. it becomes less. But anytime I start to get myself in kind of thing of, or I hear people kind of go into a thing of. How bad it is now! I just think, well, it's a. There's a lot of great musicians now. I can't think of a time when there were so many great, swinging young drummers, musical, great sounds, mm -hmm. great bass. I don't. Have, that's not enough gigs to call all the guys that I right. want to play with now. Yeah. Think about singers. There's so many great singers now, and you know, even singers. Like yeah. that was the thing. Like back then, you know. And it's just like I don't want to say a golden age, but somehow the the information being so available to so many people has made a lot of 
made a lot of musicians and a lot of right. people that are really strong and really good. So I don't feel this kind of like things ain't what they used to be thing at all. I just feel like great, you know, there's a lot of people <laughs> doing a lot of different stuff and there always was back then. And, but there's just a lot of everything now and yeah. people, you know, you can't just lament, well, they don't do this anymore. And like, no, nope, there's somebody doing it. Somewhere. Yeah, Somewhere, there's some there's young cats into it, it yeah. too, and it's just well, like... Well, I've noticed recently, like, there's this kind of really resurgence of people that are really into bebop. There's that, yeah. It's like, yeah. I, I mean, it was a little bit here when I moved to New York, like, there are I mean, few, I'm, but there's I'm, I'm a few talking like Barry guys. Harris kind of yeah, like school. that's right. Like, yeah. I think, you people know... People absorb that lesson, and really, you know, they, they want that aesthetic, and they go for it, yeah. and they're doing it, and, and just the, also the diversity, like... You know, so many more women players, so mm -hmm. many more like, you know, people from all around the world, you know, and yeah. that's just positive, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's positive. It can only be positive. If there were more clubs around and more places to play, that well, would be great. That's the thing great, is like, how is, how is there so many more musicians and so many more people into the music, but, but less like, gigs? <laughs> well, it's because I think the culture is, I mean, a lot of times the culture is here now. Yeah, you know. Well, I, I've always said. Uh, I mean, there is no reason to get a gig if you can just turn your camera on in your bedroom and play right. and play uh, giant steps. That's right. You know, that's right. It's there is no reason to to get to that next level for a lot of people, like because yeah. they're already at a they're already on social media. Like they're right. right to them. There's there was never a time where they and they yeah. saw like music on a super high level. Right. So to them, it's just like, oh well, I play jazz, I learned this tune, and now here's my phone and here's my camera. And Boom. They can, yeah, check and then me out. they never go out thing. to hear music. Yeah, because and where are they going to go? It depending on well, where they live. You where know, are they, they have to go? make a pilgrimage to some place where there's some music. And well, yeah, back in the day, people would have to travel, drive, or fly, go hear some music in New York City or Chicago or New Orleans, wherever, or go to the concerts wherever they were right. in Europe. But now it's just like, well, I can just watch YouTube all That's night. That's true. <laughs> I don't have but, to travel anymore. But it's also, I mean, an obvious difference of just lifestyle. Like when the music was kind of in you know at its height in terms of the venues and all the places it, people that's what they did to entertain themselves mm -hmm. there was like some there was radio maybe tv came along in the 50s and people mm -hmm. kind of would watch that but still there were only like a couple of channels well, yeah, it's well, not people, like people were freaking out i, I you know i did that that whole series thing on movies and yeah. when TV came around, like the film industry was like kind of reacting the same way people are reacting to Spotify uh, now. Of course, they were like this yeah. is going to kill the movie industry. No one's like go people out. just sitting yeah. at home watching like exactly. television. No one's going to go to the theater. That's right. Like That's so, right. it's like I think there was right. al there's always been something. People had pianos in their house so they could entertain themselves exactly. by playing the piano. And they like, would go out and buy yeah. sheet music, and you know yeah. that's why. That's why people play like someone love an E flat because that the lead sheet is an E flat That's for right. people to play at home. <laughs> you know, it's like just stay in that key <laughs> after right. that. That's right. It was like, uh, no, but Blakey played a shit in A flat, man. Sounds yeah. great. <laughs> it's a different, yeah. That's right. But it's a different culture. People, I mean, people have home entertainment systems mm -hmm. now, and yeah. and it's just like not just like TV. It's like you know. So there's just a lot. But again, that same thing is give people giving people access to a lot of information they can see these jazz there was no jazz films when i was coming up there was like like i said you had to oh, go to the museum yeah. of broadcasting and rent out you know like not rent but just si sign out the you know this yeah. videotape and watch it with headphones and a thing and and then go home and yeah. that, you couldn't you know it wasn't in everyone's house all uh, yeah. and all this footage when it started to come out it was like where where has this been where <laughs> is this all you know, so I don't know. No, I, it's amazing. It's just so the information's there, but you know, I, I think things go in cycles. Like people get tired of just being home and just, you know, that insulation. People I think will it, seek I, out. I, you know, after this whole quarantine thing, I'm hoping there's a resurgence of people like yeah. wanting, craving to hear live music and wanting to spend money. And it certain happened. Certainly happened in the last pandemic in the 20s. You know when that. Yeah stopped and people started to come out they were partying like never before yeah you know like the jazz age and but the difference with that is that's when people had, could come out that's what they had to do they right. weren't that was it <laughs> they weren't in there i'm just going to stay in my computer and like you say watch, you know, watch youtube it's funny you and, say that because you make it a point 
at your gigs to say to thank the audience for leaving their house. Yeah, I know. Which seems that really... like so funny. And then the first time I heard you say that, I was like, that is like an actual thing. Like, yeah. thank you for leaving your home and yep. not, and to, you know. And keeping like, this going, yeah. Yeah, keep, you know, not now, just watching me, Netflix and YouTube and coming out and seeing live music. Yeah, I can't say it now. Like, what are you, are you crazy? Aren't you afraid? <laughs> no, like, like, no. You get canceled. Man. You get yeah. canceled. No, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> It was, yeah, but I, I felt it like, you know, as a thing back then, like this is a, still a phenomenon. This is yeah. great. People don't have to do this. They don't have to, but there's something that is yeah, not I mean, the same. It, it's not the same hearing instruments vibrating in a room. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as, you know, watching it on a screen and even with good headphones or whatever, it's just yeah. not the same. So, but that's how the music is being, you know. Right flung out to the all the corners of the earth and so you know it's just what it is yeah at least it's, it's not <laughs> stamped out you know yeah but that's you know man another person hope. uh to just um I, I wanted to ask you about playing with sunny i never i mean i, yeah. I didn't get to hear you that band yeah man, but how it was incredible i mean how did that come about like what well it came about because uh it was lucky. I mean, you want some more of this? I'm good, actually. I'm okay. good. Um, yeah, Sonny went back to uh, he he went he had Russell Malone in the band. Well, he had Bobby Broom back in his band, who, who I had seen with Sonny in the early '80s. Bobby Broom played with Sonny oh, wow. when he was like I don't even think he was 20 yet, and he toured with Sonny, and you know went on and did his thing, and then came back in the band. I think around I don't know, maybe it was 2000 six or seven or something like that i'd have to ask him about that but he played a few more years with sonny and then there was some kind of uh some falling out of some kind and then uh sonny needed a guitar player so he got russell to sub mm -hmm. kind of last minute and then there were some gigs coming up that summer where russell wasn't able to make like he was contracted to play with somebody at that time and so I got a call to sub for Russell on a couple of, like three gigs in, in some summer festivals. It was like mm -hmm. North Sea was my first one, Umbria yeah. in, in Perugia, and then <clears throat> up in Molde, Norway, was my first three gigs. With, and with this Sunny. was recent? 2010, okay. summer of 2010. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think, well, Jim Hall, I think, I think maybe he didn't initially hear about me from Jim Hall. It was through Paul Jeffries, mm -hmm. uh, late great saxophone player, who uh, maybe recommended. He was really tight with Sonny, and he had maybe because I think someone told me that I think it was Grant Stewart had met Paul Jeffries and said that somehow he knew we knew each other, and Paul Jeffries told Grant to tell me that he liked my Monk record or something like that, and so yeah. that was a, like a second hand compliment from Paul Jeff who played with Monk he was like yeah. Monk's last but I was like wow that's incredible and Paul and Paul I had just missed Paul Jeffries at Rutgers he's kind of started the program mm -hmm. at Rutgers but so I knew who he was and but then I got a call from Paul Jeffries and it's like yeah I think you know would you want to play with Sonny or something like that and I was like of course you know and so wait is that how it happened no I think first I just got a call from Sonny because <laughs> I actually I thought it was John Weber giving me a you know, like doing a, a crank call because he's an incredible <laughs> wow. uh, mimic. John Weber can do voices like. And then I saw the number, like he left me a message, and I saw the number was like a 518, like an upstate area. Because like, yeah. John Weber wouldn't be that elaborate in, a, right, in, his, right, right. in, his, in his, you know, to get and call me from an. Well, this could be real. So I listened to it again. I was like, God, that's got to be him, you know. So, so I called <laughs> him back, and then he said, Would you uh, make these three gigs? I want you to sub. We'll send you the. You know, CD of some of the later gigs. You can hear the tunes, but we're not going to have a chance to rehearse. Is that okay? You know, I was yeah. like, well, sure. If it's okay, you know, I'll listen to the thing. I'm like, <laughs> no, sure. Man, I need to rehearse. Man. Yeah, I yeah. I was like, day. okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sure. <laughs> and so, and it was, and so that was. I remember going. Over, I knew Bob Cranshaw a little bit through Mike Ladon, so I went over to Cranshaw's house, yeah. and he kind of prepped me for a few tunes <clears> that Sonny might do. We went over the tunes that I had heard on the CD, and he was so nice and everything. And, Yes, I don't like to do this one and this one. And then we did the gig at North Sea, uh, and we played a couple of the tunes that Sonny had uh, sent me. And then Sonny went into uh, They Say It's Wonderful. They Say Falling in Love is Wonderful. And luckily, I knew the tune. Like, I just kind of, <laughs> he started playing it, and I think it was like I kind of 
kind of knew it and like I played it in F. I was like, wait, Sonny's not an F. Okay, okay. I think he was in D flat or maybe E flat. And I just got through it. Like I knew the tunes, so right. you know. And uh, so that was cool. That wasn't audible. Not right. even audible. He just started playing it, you know. Right. Didn't even call it. So I got through that and... Uh, and that, and the next gig was a few days later because the way Sonny traveled was like, he'd play a gig, then have an off day, then travel, then have an off day, then do yeah. the gig. And so it was like, it took about ten days to do these three gigs. So I was kind of out there, <laughs> and we never really saw Sonny except for the gigs, and soundtrack and everything. But I was just thrilled. I couldn't believe like that that was him. Right. You know, it's like I'm <clears throat> ten feet away from Sonny Wild. You know, like right. I just never because he was one of my just you know my my idol in terms of like showing right. everybody. And those are kind of probably one of few, some of the last gigs he did, right? Well, in two thousand twelve, yeah, unfortunately, it was when he had to stop playing. But then the next year, two thousand eleven, I don't know what happened necessarily with Russell. He think maybe he just had a lot of other commitments or whatever. However, it, it went down. I ended up doing all the gigs in 2011, which wasn't that many. He went out a couple times, mm -hmm. and it was like, like I say, it took 10 days to do three gigs. <laughs> so it was a lot of downtime, but it was great. And uh, I was just like thrilled to be around him. The soundtracks were super fun because he would yeah. play all kinds of tunes and just go into stuff. And oh, he'd wow. play long at the soundtrack wow. and long at the gig. But <clears throat> it was just amazing to be around someone who I felt was like this guy was there when the you know, the alphabet yeah. was being created that yeah, we used to, of course. to form letters and words. But you never I mean, really got to hang with him? A like... few times. I mean, yeah, he didn't really hang, you know, like, you know, we wouldn't really see him except on the gig yeah. day. Well, a couple of times, like, he after the gig, I'd have to, you know, went to his room to get paid or something like that. Yeah. And then we would hang, and he, we had some great talks, beautiful, you know, very... Uh, Spiritual I mean, too, and yeah, sp sp to, spiritual like, guy. Like I, that's the thing too. Like some of the stuff, and and it was great playing with him. And he was very nice and very encouraging. The only thing he ever said was like, "Don't be afraid to step on my toes. Just play more. You know, yeah. I want to. I don't want you just to comp. I want a conversation. You know. Okay. So I would think like, yeah, you know, here is like, you know, the wizard right. wanted me to have a just you know, have a conversation. Like, well. Any conversation with the wizard or the oracle of Delphi, Delphi would be, you'd have a lot of respect for this. Right. You know, it's like, I'm not just going to be like, so anyway, I was, you know, like, it's not that kind of conversation. <laughs> but I would try, like, well, I have to, you know, not be so respectful. I have to not yeah. worry about, like, playing the wrong thing or, you know, worry, you know, not worry about messing up. Right. And, and that was... <clears throat> What he wanted, if he felt that I was trying not to make, you know, make, make a mistake, that's not good. Yeah. That's not the place you want to be. You want to be in the place where you're, you could just fall off and play something totally fucked up at any right. minute. Yeah. But that's kind of the, what was amazing to see him play, was just how audacious he was. Like he would just, because a lot of his tunes were very much centered, like vamps, very mm -hmm. much in a tonal center. Yeah. And just the way he would just push up against that tonal center in right. different ways was just like. Man, that is just, you know, aud audacious. It was yeah. just like, wow, he's just leaning on that note, which is, <clears throat> I'm getting used to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you start, he just started to make you hear in a different way. And I could, I only thought it, it could only come from like playing for so long and just kind of push for a long time now, pushing out from the inside. Right. You know. Right. So it was just that, just looking for something different and all about melody and all about like parenthetical asides between the melody like that mm -hmm. was kind of what his you know if I could break it down to some concept but it was just like statements of melody and then these kind of harmonic like clusters of like like little things going off around the melody which might be not connected to the harmony in a certain yeah. in a traditional way or a, it would just be against that so it was just like Open your ears, open your, you know, <laughs> open your, open your rhythmic feeling, you know, like, just like, so that was the thing, and see him in Cranshaw, because Cranshaw was just like, yeah, rooted, you know, he was just like, and that was his job, that's what, he wasn't out there to follow Sonny into some other, so I would kind of be in between, like, I know Sonny didn't want me to follow him out there, but I also, you know, didn't need to double the route either, you know, right, it's yeah. kind of like finding some middle ground. And also thinking like, well, Sonny doesn't really need comping 
at all anyway. So what am I, what am I doing? How am I adding to the, but I just found myself up there trying to think, well, what, what can I add? What can I add to the rhythm? Mm -hmm. What can I add to the harmony? And it was great. And then just, I mean, I always loved to comp and I just felt so lucky at that time. Like, well, I get to comp for like, you know, like, but he didn't, he wanted a question, like a question and answer kind of a discussion. And one time after a gig, like, cause he would say, uh, a lot of times he would never stop playing. Like he would play the melody and then he would, with his body language, he would turn away from the audience. And then I figured out after a while that meant it was my time to solo. Okay. When I first played, it wasn't Clifton Anderson. It was just, there was no other horn besides Sonny. So, if, and, and even later, if Clifton didn't play, it was for me to step forward and, and take that space and just start soloing. And sometimes Sonny wouldn't really stop. Right. So he would kind of be accompanying me. Yeah. And, uh, and then one time I just remember it like, okay, he's going to keep playing and I'm going to keep playing. Yeah. And then he kept playing and we kind of ended up playing two choruses together on like a <laughs> walking ballad, not really like both soloing. And at the end of the gig that he was like, yeah, that's what I want. Just a, con- just a conversation. So it just kind of was like a thing of like, you know, are you anywhere close enough to being strong enough to sit right. and have a conversation with mm-hmm. this person who you think of as, you know, objectively as. Right. The Oracle. Did you, you know, the the, the did Dalai you feel, Lama? You know. Did you feel like after, after that happened? Do you feel? Did you feel like, I've, you you were there and and and, and it came out. I was just relieved. I just relieved that there's <laughs> something he noticed and there's something that yeah that's what I'm looking for. This like you know don't be, don't stop playing if right. I'm being you know active. Just just <clears throat> stay in your in your thing and we can right. just like. And sometimes that, on a gig I, I feel like, oh man this is this is not working or like, I don't know if I'm right. doing what they want. And then, right. You know, well, it definitely wasn't up to me to, to decide, you know, like sometimes I would be like, wow, we, we played this slow waltz sometimes, like not slow, but like kind of a short eight bar tune or a, really a short tune, slow waltz, like an Italian song. And Sonny would, we'd all play on it. And it was a short form I'd play as long as I could play. And then, you know, but then Sonny would trade with the drummer for, I'm not exaggerating, 10 minutes. Wow. Fours on a slow <laughs> boom, ch- ch- boom, ch- <laughs> And after a while, the drummer, like, what do they have to play after? Right. I mean, like, it's like, but Sonny would just keep going. And I'm just like, wow, I'm like, this is going on a long time. Yeah. So what does the audience think who's not right. even if that, you know? But he just, I don't think he really, he was just like, I'm going after something. I want to get to it. No, once we've exchanged and got through our to our wall, we want to get past the wall. I'm challenging the drummer to see if he can come up with something right. after ten minutes wow. on a slow three four, and, and it was just like excessively <laughs> long by any you know by any objective standard of like this is a long time to listen to trading yeah. on a waltz. Right. But I think he was you know he and he had such charisma too. He could kind of pull off stuff that. You know, most people would, it would be boring, you right. know? Yeah. And maybe some people were like, I mean, there was, I, mean, I think Sonny felt a lot of pressure to be, son, you know, like, and a lot of nights he wasn't happy, you know, mm-hmm. with the band or with himself. And uh, I just remember feeling like, wow, this guy's, he's 80 years old now. And there's like 8,000 people out there screaming, you know, for right. him, love, you know, and he's just like, <clears throat> damn it, I can't, get to, you know, he was just like, what am yeah. I doing? You know, I was you, playing you a cadenza like once. Yeah. He was playing a cadenza once. He took the horn out of his mouth. No one could hear but us on the stage. And he was like, what am I doing up here? Like he was that, he was like, he was just kind of, he would still you get frustrated, you know? You think that's part of his personality? Probably. I, 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 he was I probably he always. was like a kind of like almost always. Yeah. You ever heard of like a, and what is it? What do they call it? Like a, ah, sh- not in, Poster syndrome, or it's where you don't feel like you're you're oh. you earned what uh, mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm. The whatever status you right have right right. But I've heard stories about Sonny where he's like, you know, he would put on a, a Coltrane record to somebody in the car and be like, "What do you think of this?" And they would like, they would be like, "Oh, it's fuck, it's great, it's amazing." Mm-hmm. And he would just like he kicked him out of the car like on the George Washington Bridge. You ever heard that story? No, I forgot who that was, but it was somebody he put on Giant Steps, like in the car. Or it was on the radio or something, right. and he asked the guy in the car, like, wow. what do you what think do you of think? this? And they were like, it's killing, it's great. amazing. And he was like, get, get out. the fuck out of the car. Wow, I can't and believe it was... that. It doesn't sound like it, but, <laughs> but he, you know, he definitely, I think he was like a perfectionist. And, you know, knowing that perfection is not 
ever attainable. Right. But he would it would still upset him if he didn't get as close as he wanted to. You know, and yeah. like he was still he wasn't ever gonna go out there and just like, you know, play a few notes and I'm gonna play like Sonny Rollins. I'm gonna be, some, you know, play right. the part of Sonny Rollins. He's just like <clears throat> always reaching and knowing that I have played that before. I'm not gonna play that. I'm gonna play. So I'm gonna push yeah. past and really like took improvising really seriously as a great challenge and a privilege. I mean, the, the deepest just the one anecdote that I was there was a drummer once who was doing a rehearsal to sub on the on the band and. Uh, we did this rehearsal and we were trying to rehearse this Calypso tune of Sonny's and it was like kind of not coming together. He kept like, let's try it in E flat. Let's try it in different keys. And mm -hmm. it wasn't grooving and it wasn't happening. And he was like shaking his head, not happy. The drummer was getting like, yeah. shit, what am I doing? You know, what, what can I do? And so Sonny would say some things and try to get it and it just wasn't happening. Finally, something, we, we changed the tempo or something. And then Sonny was like positive. It was like, yeah, it's yeah. starting to feel right. This feels good. And then... It was like such a relief because it's like he wondered like you know if it was going to go the other way and like whatever it was like it started to get better so I was like yeah it feels that feels good that feels a lot better starting to this is what I'm hearing you know and the drummer was like really reverent and really wanted to please Sonny you know so he said you know uh, Mr. Rollins on this kind of calypso should I have the snare drum open or closed like just yeah. a typical question about the sound of the drums right. you know <clears throat> valid question and Sonny like thought about the question for like it was like 20 seconds so it was like after five seconds you're like oh it's been quiet for a long time he's something this is not this wasn't a good like oh no like what's gonna happen things were just starting to go right yeah but then suddenly after thinking about it for a minute he was just like you know you can do what you want you know if the music feels right and you're mm -hmm. playing to serve the music you can do whatever you want you're here to make decisions you're here to uh, do what you think is best. And if you think about it, you couldn't be in a more privileged position. And I never thought about what improvising was in that light. I always like had the sense of like, I want to play well. So I want to sound like the people that I right. think play well. And I want to play, I mean, I wasn't just like, I want to play right. I want to, but there's that in your head of like, you know, not to be that imposter, but to be the, you know. Mm -hmm. And Sonny was just like, and he, he even went on to say, I remember this part too, because he's like, you know, there's symphonies full of great musicians all over the world that watch the conductor and play the notes that are put on the page in front of them. We don't have that. We have to decide what to play and also how to play it mm -hmm. with what intent and what, you know, and that's freedom. Yeah. You know, that's true freedom. And if you can deal with that freedom, if you can, you know, not just be about, Oh, I can do whatever I want, but to serve the music because it was a long time where the music wasn't feeling right and it wasn't happy, you know, because yeah. it wasn't coming together. He wanted to, so when he started feeling right and the vibe got happy, and then the guy was like, What can I do to make you more happy? I was like, No, 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 you don't have to be, we're not a Calypso band, you don't have to be authentic, <laughs> you don't have to right. be, you just have to do what you think is right. And if you think it's right, it is right, right. you know. And I was like, Wow, that's. Improvis that's what improvisation is. It's like dealing with the freedom that you have. Yeah. A lot of people, they don't want to play like themselves. They want to play like somebody mm -hmm. else because they, it's too much freedom. They'd rather play what they think is right. So it's like a moment of like, okay, it's going to take me a lot of years to put this into practice, but now I have an idea of what improvising means. It's like we can, make, we can play what notes we want. And it's yeah. like, if you just state, state that fact, it's heavy. And that <laughs> really is like an incredible privilege. So what are you going to do with that privilege? What are you going to do with that freedom? Are you going to, you know, learn the music so much to the point where you've kind of, you know, kept your freedom from being really free? Or are you just going to kind of shit on that freedom and do, well, I can do whatever I want because I'm expressing myself. Right. Well, that's not the, that's the other yeah, extreme. So that's you have to find the middle where you're serving the music and you've learned the music. But then when you play, it's like, it's about the freedom you have. And, and whatever enthusiasm and joy or whatever intensity comes with connecting with and, and, and like just coming to terms with that freedom you have, that privilege, 
then you can start to get someplace. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's like pretty. And so I, I was just so thankful from that <laughs> moment of like, I'm so glad I got to hear that because that's really what, what it's about. You know, it's not yeah. about playing right, whether it's the style. This is how they play now. That's not how they play anymore. So don't play right, that. You know, right, like right. it's all that doesn't really exist. It's only like, is the musician connected to what they're playing, and are they connected to the uh, that privilege that they yeah. have, that freedom? You know, it's a heavy thing. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Man, so. I wanted to ask you just because you have this u unique kind of uh, experience of having played with Jimmy Cobb, Harold Mayburn, and Mel Ryan, and who all played with Wes. That's true. Yeah. So what were you yeah. thinking about that when you played with with all of them? Because that, those are all separate gigs, not like you were doing that's them true. at the same time. No, but that's right. Um, well, <clears throat> Melvin, I mean, he was around Wes when he was a young guy, and Wes mm -hmm. was older than him, and he, you know, he was aware that, you know. Wes was kind of like his teacher and, and uh, you know, someone he played got him out there. But I right. think he also, like Wes, Wes kind of became a star and Wes kind of had to leave his Indianapolis guys behind a little bit and like go out and make records with yeah. Hank Jones and Tommy mm -hmm. Flanagan and the guys. And so I think Melvin, like from that, like he kind of got very sour on the music business and kind of retreated, went back to Indianapolis when mm -hmm. they lived in Milwaukee. He didn't like New York. He didn't want to be... Like the music business was kind of rough back then, as much as we might think of it as like the golden age. Of, but there were a lot of great musicians who didn't get that, you know, right. record contract or didn't get management or whatever. And then they're just like out. Yeah. They're just out there. So Melvin had a lot of, I think, you know, mixed feelings about he loved Wes, but he also felt like, you know, it showed him <laughs> like what the, what the, and he was kind of mistrustful of Tekens at first and until he realized yeah. that Tekens was just trying to give him a chance to play and record right, his music. Yeah. But, but, uh, so, but he loved Wes and, and for me, it just was like, you know, just to be around him, like, it was like a connection yeah. that I could never have to Wes, you know, who, who he died. I was one, one year old, not even, <laughs> you know, um, but, yeah, and Cobb too. Cobb and Cobb played a bit with Wes, and uh, but it's mostly through the Winton Kelly because he had that yeah. group with Winton Kelly and, and and Paul Chambers, and they played with Wes. And but he just said Wes was grooving all the time, and he said first Winton and Wes had to work it out. That's what Cobb said. They had to work out well, how I, to play together, yeah. you know, because I think <clears> maybe you know any time you know they, they have a trio and somebody comes in, it's, and especially someone who's going to play chords, play chords, yeah. yeah. So they kind of worked it out, but but uh, I mean, I mean, I, I think it was like, all even love, on you know. smoking at the half note. There's, yeah, there's some times where I hear Wes playing and when when Kelly's playing, I'm yeah. like, I would probably be laying out right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like if Wes is kind of playing, he like, get it. He would get in there and too. And I was it like, was nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> for sure. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, but so but but Cobb loved Wes and said that was. A, was grooving all the time and yeah. just gave gave you know jimmy liked those guys that gave him stuff to play you know that, that yeah you know i mean those are sure. great tunes the west tunes are incredible man but I remember like drummers on, and guitar players yeah oh he was a great writer man west yeah. was incredible tunes but i remember on, on melvin's first record date the one that we did we came back after uh brian lynch's date the next day with no mm. rehearsal right. and did a record because there was no time for a rehearsal we just came back the next day and did it and uh Melvin wanted to do Trick Bag, mm -hmm. which I kind of knew, but I never really learned. Like, I yeah. kind of knew it, but I didn't. It was like, I was like, I hadn't really, you know. So I'm trying to learn it, like that bridge. But right. And I was just kind of panicking because I was like, can we take it a little bit slower? And Kenny Washington was like, no, you <laughs> definitely can't play it slower than the original. If anything, we could play it faster, but right. not slower. I'm like, okay. Thanks, Kenny. Point well taken. <laughs> You're right about that. I agree with you in theory, but like I have to play it. Just so, for the next two minutes. Can yeah, we yeah. Take it as slower? like, can we play it? Can we record it slower then speed it up? I might have even said that as in a wise ass uh, yeah. moment. But uh, I was just trying to. That was a little bit of a panic of learning that and feeling yeah. like, oh man, I don't want to be fucking up West tunes right. with Melvin. Right. And even though Melvin was like, I'll show it to you. You, you get it. You know, yeah, he was. Yeah. But he was like. He was like, you don't know that one? You know, I was like, yeah, I, like, show me that bridge. That I was getting scared because those yeah. hits, you know, yeah. and like, 
It's like, it's, you kind of have to work it out, which you don't want to do like, okay, we're ready for a take? You know, no, yeah, no not ready, uh, yeah. not ready. Can we rehearse this again? And like, so there was a little bit of panic in that and just feeling like, you know, but it wasn't even like filling any kind of shoes. It was just like, I just want to, I want to not mess up the music. Yeah, you just want you to yeah. <laughs> So that was a little like, you know, trial by fire, but. But what? But Melvin never said. Well, Wes did this and Wes did that. He kind of wasn't yeah. in that space anymore. He was just enjoying getting to record what he wanted to do and play mm -hmm. his tunes. He would always show us his tunes. No never, music, nothing right? ever written out. It was always just by ear. And then he would come to the date the next day when we did get a chance to rehearse for the next records and try to change it. And Kenny <laughs> was like, "No, no, I recorded it as Walkman." He said, "No, I, yeah. you did it like this. It's, I think that's better, Mel." And that's because Kenny would go home and learn it yeah, too, yeah, and yeah. he had it shit together. <laughs> And he was right, you know, it was right, it was cool the first time, and yeah. Mel would go, like, let's, can we just do this? And <laughs> Kenny was like, no, let's, let's keep it the way we did it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thinking that Melvin could necessarily do it the way he did it mm -hmm. the first time. Like, Melvin was just spontaneous, and it's like, if he felt like doing it this way, kind of Melvin was like, Sometimes, if I feel like doing it this way, I wish you'd do it this way. Yeah. Like, well, we learned it this way, well, you know, so. <laughs> Melvin was very spontaneous and very much, you know, <clears throat> but he was just, I think, enjoying getting to play his own tunes which were yeah, great for sure. Nicholas actually brought that was one of the happiest I ever saw Melvin was when Nicholas brought me and Melvin out to New Orleans to play with him and Adonis and uh, Bryce Winston was oh, playing wow. tenor with, uh, with Nicholas at that time great tenor player <clears throat> and uh, Nicholas had gotten one of Melvin's crisscross records with Eric and Ryan Kaiser mm -hmm. and just wrote the tunes out for him and Bryce and uh, the first time I ever saw charts of Melvin's right. tunes and Nicholas. That's crazy. He's like, you guys know him, right? Like, yeah, sure. But but Melvin was so happy that, you know, this young guy yeah. wanted to bring him out to play his music. And, mm -hmm. you know, he knew Nick was a was a heavy cat, but also that he was like, you know, didn't have to do that. He was right. playing with Mel because he wanted to play with Mel. And, oh, man, and Melvin was, was happy. He happened. was happy. He, Melvin was so happy. And I was just so happy to see <laughs> Melvin like, yeah, this is great. You know, I'm really enjoying. You know, he felt... He felt good, you know. Oh, really man. nice. That's amazing. But Mayburn was great, and I, you know, got to play with Mayburn later on. I was always like, always go hear him with, with George Coleman, and I was always kind of afraid to, you know, call Mabes for gigs, and Farns was just like, call Mabes, call Mabes, call yeah. Mabes. And I was, finally I did it, and, and I was just like, uh, did you guys play the Vanguard? We did. With, because with, I think that's the only, yeah. that's, I, I heard that, that gig. With Cobb, yeah. 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 And Weber, yeah. Um, yeah, Mayburn was great, and he, and he, he loved Wes a lot. He would, but he didn't, and Cobb never did, didn't want to like play covers of Wes. They never mm -hmm. trying to say, you should play like, like some Wes tunes. He right. was like, we'll play whatever you want to play, you know, and they were cool like that. <laughs> but it was a link that I, you know, I felt connected to, to somebody, even though, you know, we couldn't have, I mean, I couldn't a, have known him. But three huge, huge links, man. To yeah. Like <laughs> but I, I, yeah, I just felt. Oh, that brings me a little bit closer to that. And, uh, you know, yeah, same thing just like when I was playing with Dr. Lonnie. I just knew him from the George Benson records. Yeah, of like, course. Yeah, and Lonnie. Yeah, let's yeah say. that was it. That was it. Like, that's, you know, and George would come out when, when I played with Lonnie, too. That was a couple oh, times. Man. He came to the Vanguard once when I was playing with Louie, played my guitar for a few tunes. It was thrilling, man. George oh, was man. incredible. I still have never met George Benson. What? Oh, yeah, well, he never, moved away a while back. He used to live in Jersey, and he would he would hang out a lot. He'd go to the zinc bar all the time, and mm -hmm. you would see him around. But uh, yeah, something man. Yeah. Jim Hall was there the night that George sat in at the Vanguard. I really? And Jim was kind of like, well, I was a little disappointed because I really I, I came to hear you, but uh, now that I heard George, I think I don't know what to do. I think I might just go. You know, Jim was like. <laughs> Wow, that guy, you know, I was like, but I was just like, oh, shit, I'm at the Vanguard, and, you know, here are these two, you know, pillars yeah. of the, you know. Man. But, well, man, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm so glad, like, you could pass through. It's and, nice and, to and, wrap, and, man. And, we could wrap all here. night. Yeah, I, exactly. exactly. I got, like, halfway through all this stuff, but it's, uh, I mean. Man, I talk too much. This, right now. I'm sorry. The, no, 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 it's, 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 it's all great. <laughs> But I mean, you've played with so many, so many people. It's 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 incredible, and I've gotten to play with like a handful of of the same people. We've worked, you know, with Josh and and That's with right. um, 
Ralph Bowen and John Gordon and, and wow. Nicholas yeah, also Bowen, and yeah. Sammy Hell and 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 every time I play with any of them, I'm like, you know, Peter's done this gig. Ah, you know, it's well, like it's different gigs, but no, you know. no, it's 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 just the thing. It's like that's why I was so curious yeah. about asking you about playing with Jimmy Cobb and playing yeah. with Harold because it's just you can't you can't go into a gig like that and be like. Well, yeah. I'm the first guy to do, you know, yeah. it's like, no, that's it's right. like you got to know who you're playing with and like who they played with and what they've had heard in the past and maybe right, what they're right. expecting right. to some degree. And, yes. and, you know, and finding the balance of like, how much can I try to, you know, a little bit fill some of that and, and do what I do in it and like, and well, maybe try something that I, I don't even know I can do yet or right, you know, some things right. like that, but. It's all balance, you know. Well, you're lucky to be, um, you know, maybe the one of the last generations that can have that apprenticeship, you know. I remember hearing you playing with, like, Greg Osby and people like that, and, like, you know. Yeah. It's like, this is, this is you know, and he wasn't, like, an elder elder, but he was, you know. Yeah, so the people a, that were around, yeah. you know. And and it's, just, it's, you know, fewer and further between now. Of, of, yeah. Of, there's just not that many of that generation, but you did it. You were sought out by, by elders and by... You know, contemporaries too, which is even more important in a way for longevity's sake. You know, and, and of making music that's going to be of the time that it's created in. You know, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I just feel lucky because I spent so much time just you're, you're wanting, right. wanting you're to be between, around. Man. You're, you're but I like... wanted to be around my elders, and <clears throat> I I was lucky to do that somewhat. And then I realized, like, well, that's great. But then there's time passes and and they're yeah. they're not all they're not a, well, you know i mean lonnie's gone mel's gone it's incredible but you got to do every, i mean i feel like you got to do both like yeah you, were, you had one foot here and the other foot there and it was yeah. they were both moving and at the well, same time and um yeah i feel like i right. wish i had gotten to play with more of, of, of the other generation and you know it's like yeah. i've gotten to do yeah some stuff outside of jazz which right. feels like that because there's right. no music Right. And 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 there's no bullshit. There's no like, oh, you kind of hit the changes. They're not right. thinking about that. They're just right. like that. I don't know what to tell you what you're doing wrong, but it's not right. right. <laughs> like that right. kind of thing. Right. Whereas like I feel like you know some other band leaders that are that are you know musically educated, they can kind of be like, man, this is this mm -hmm. is exactly what's wrong, or you know, right. So and so, but um, but anyway, I I, I always one of the one things I wanted to mention is like maybe. There's been a couple of times where I've been a little bit super nervous to be on stage because I met you when you were in Houston playing with Josh. Right. And I, you know, I met Josh that day and I had him sign yeah. my my wow, CD. Wow, that's like, amazing. That's the Wish amazing. CD with Pat Metheny. Yeah. All right. Um, that was the first time I heard Pat. By the way, was on the Josh Redman Wish album. Wow. Yeah. That's deep. So that was my first Pat record, and uh, so I had Josh sign that, and then I met you, and then I moved to New York, studied with you, and then like 2005, I was playing. At the Cork Jazz Festival with with right. Josh. Wow! And you were in and the Sam. You were there, and Sam was right. And, and Greg Hutch. Oh no, Greg missed that gig. Okay. Because uh, because his um, his girlfriend had gone into labor like oh, the day before. In Cork, I was there. You were there. I don't. I can't remember who you were playing with, but you were in the audience. Wow. And. And you were just like, oh shit! You like yeah. you guys are playing. And I was like on stage. I was like, man, this was is like a complete wow, one eighty. No... Yeah, that's it funny. It was two thousand five in Cork. I, yeah, I feel like maybe you were there playing with Larry and it could have been with Ladon too. I don't or Ladon. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, that's wild, man. But yeah. like, I was on stage and I could see you in the audience. I was like, that's this out, is man. this is like a complete one eighty. I was like, this is I can't. I was that's so funny. nervous. And not only because of that, once it was also like super hot in the venue. Yeah. And then we, uh, Nate Smith was subbing. Okay. And he didn't know he was going to do the gig till that morning. And he was just there in court playing with, with uh, Dave, Dave Holland. Right. So, so he got Josh it. got him on the gig. Okay. And we were all kind of nervous about how the gig was going to go. And I was like, fuck, right. this is the one gig Peter's going to see. Us. That's funny. Man. And the, the funny thing is, Nate fucking killed that gig. I bet. Yeah. He listened to the music on his headphones. Right. Uh, the only thing I could think of is that I, Josh had been asking about drummers, and I was I had right. just played a tour with Nate on with, with um, Josh Roseman, and I oh, told yeah, Josh Trump. I was like, "There's yeah. this fucking guy Nate Smith that sounds yeah. unbelievable." Right. And and I I called Nate. I was like, "I think Josh is going to call you for some gigs." Right. And he might have kind of 
at least listen to the album. Oh, before he got a heads up, Because what he did up, was yeah. unbelievable, man. Like, right, I mean, he, he, he was at the dinner table. We were having dinner before the, the, the and gig. And he was listening there, to it. It was a festival, so there was no sound check, just a line check. Right. He listened to the gig. He had the charts in front of him. He was eating and listening, and then he was like, cool, cool, cool. We played the gig, and it was unbelievable. Yeah, he's quite a musician. It was so man. unbelievable yeah. that after the gig, he asked Josh for more money. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, yeah, we're gonna I did good. Like, yeah. <laughs> so That's nice. but it was, it was unreal, man. And, but I remember like the gig was so, I was nervous. And then the gig, it was so hot in the venue. And then Nate was so killing. I got it like a nosebleed <laughs> like during yeah. the gig. And I had to like, like go off stage for a second. Yeah. And like, uh, you know, it's like, and that hadn't happened wow. to me since I was like a teenager. Yeah. Man. It's like, I used to get that shit when I was a, like right. a teenager. That's, like, that's in really a terrible dry feeling, yeah. But it was, it was, <laughs> it was just hilarious. I was like, damn, Nate is killing so hard that yeah. I'm being, He's like, my nose help. is bleeding. Jesus. That's pretty insane. <laughs> but it was, it was funny. But anyway, man. <laughs> but yeah, man, I love it. Beautiful, um, you know, man. It's like, yeah, inspiring, always. So I'm so glad you can come through for a Thank second you, time man. this time. Yeah, we didn't get to talk so, the first time. What, what was the reason? I forget. Was there? Well, it was like the height of COVID. It was the COVID. We just like yeah. We but also, I, I I didn't have any kind of setup. Right, you were you the did. first yeah. person. You were kind of like the guinea pig, man. That was fun. Man. And then and it, luckily, it just everything. Yeah. The, it was a killing stream. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And I, I maybe I might even I was thinking about putting it up in the next couple of days since you know just like to have both of them up for yeah. the, at the same Why time. Not? You know, so I might do that. But the it's, it's, it's funny. And the unmasked. The, the, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. <laughs> unmasked. That's right. But yeah, I didn't have I didn't have these. Yeah. I didn't have, yeah high know, tech now, man. This, you know. Yeah. You did you did the right thing, man? You seized the moment of. <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not gonna be. You know, sitting here not doing stuff. You just like I'm gonna. Right. It, it, it was, I'm gonna make my own scene right here. It's kind of a, <laughs> a thing of like basically having nothing else to do and needing to make some money. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like both. Well, yeah, but you put it, you put it out there, man. You made it, you know, took a risk too. Like just to oh, get I all this a, stuff, you know, yeah, it's, it's you weren't credit. just like, you weren't just like with your iPhone, like shed, yeah, shedding, yeah, yeah. asking for money, busking. You know, yeah. You, it was, you know, you made a, you made a thing, you know, it was a little bit of a Hail Mary. I was like, I'm just going to put a bunch of stuff on my credit card and see how this goes. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Why not? Yeah. You but, always just, you know, not pay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, it's beautiful. Cool. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, thank you. Anyway, everyone, out there who, anyone who's watching, uh, Screamsville. thank you so much. This will be up on the channel. Uh, for, okay. For, uh, inevitably. Talk radio. So, uh, yeah, talk radio, <laughs> podcast. And, Thanks, uh, man. But the stream that we did tonight was going to, you have three days. Uh, you can check that out if you'd like to support. Um, we're going to put some codes up. Well, the codes are on the, the stream uh, that we played before. But I'm about to, I'll put some codes up now. If you want, you can scan um, also on here. So, but, uh, yeah, it, man. man. Dude, thank, thank you, you so much, much man. man. Thanks, Pete. Love you, man. Thank All you. Right. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm going to do a little coding. Coding? A little coding here. Buffalo mm-hmm. Bill coding. Thanks for sitting through all that. I haven't worked so hard. You did, huh? You were changing those. <laughs> you were changing. The, you could. You could do the wild world of sports now. It's great. I-